first two ship came, actually three ship came, two ship for the coastal, one is Saudi Kama and Kostak. Kostak operated in the east coast and Saudi Kama operates in the coast. And we are having Samudra Mountain as the vessel which is going to the deep sea. In 2013, we decommissioned uh, this uh, Samudra Mountain and put that Samudra Ratnakar into place in 2014 onwards, and it is operating today. These two vessels will be replaced by another uh, two new vessels. The process is on, the tendering process has already started. Now with this vessel, what we do? We do first the baseline survey, because we understand that for any mineral exploration domain, whether it is land or sea, you need the first the topographic map. And that's why we have done the bathymetric, and from there, the seabed morphology 3D has been identified in places. We have done sampling for physical and chemical oceanographic data. And then there are both type of a geological and the geophysical data that has been collected. Both we have collected the gravity, magnetic data, the sampling by different devices, right from graph to the piston core, different type of coding system. And for augmentation of our mineral exploration point of view, we have gone for the shallow and deep seismic data. Shallow mostly in the coastal domains, deep seismic in the deep. But this is the Saudi Kama and Kostra do the shallow seismic in the coastal domain in TW and contiguous zone. And it has already been defined in earlier that uh, coastal zone, uh, uh, territorial water is up to 12 nautical miles. And uh, 24 is the uh, limit for our, the contiguous area. And 200 nm is for uh, the east, exclusive economic zone. Now, what we do with this data, the sampling that has been primarily done, we have identified the areas where the mineral deposits are there. And this is the list of the mineral deposits that has been identified, like our high-grade lime, lime mud, polymetallic crust and nodules, construction sand, heavy mineral places, mostly in the coastal part and the contiguous zone, phosphorites and the hydrothermal minerals, which has actually given us the path to go for the research estimation and the mineral block that has been given already and will be given in the near future also. Another thing is whenever the data is coming from different cruises, we have to compile this data. And once the data is compiled, data need to be shared with our stakeholders. And that is what has been done by the data compilation and sharing with the other stakeholders. Now, these are the, some of the stakeholders to whom the, the top panel, the data shared to Navy, Ministry of Arts Science, NHO, NPOL, and many academic institutions, other, other, other institutions also there where we have shared the data. Now, this is the area through which the different surveys have been conducted, which we have done, said earlier, like your multi-bit mathematics. I'm not going to the figures, but giving the, the items that has been covered, multi-bit mathematics, single bin mathematics, sub-bottom profiling, magnetic survey, gravity survey, seismic both shallow and deep. Then core sampling has been done, graph samples has been done, geochemical data is existing for the samples, and then the dress samples, water samples, the conductivity, temperature, data, and the current observations. Because of the maps, what the data we have covered? The first in the left-hand panel, the map is on a bathymetry. It covers both the single beam and multi-beam bathymetry. And we are having a program with uh, MOES, NCPR representatives are here. We used to share this data to them, and in, in turn, they are sharing this data to us. So by now, we are covering almost the western part of our uh, yeah, with the multi-beam data. Some part is left, we'll be covering in the next cruise. And also for the east coast, uh, EZ part, as well as in the Andaman. There are three, basically, over here. We have collected sediment samples. The samples uh, locations are there. These are the places where the gravity data has been collected. Basically, gravity data is less just because this gravity data has been collected by the new ship, Samudra Ye Ratnakar, most of the things. That's why the Samudra uh, Ratnakar cruises has been covered by this gravity data. Magnetic data, there are all the ships in Manthan and uh, these coastal ships and uh, Samudra Ratnakar is having. 
So this is the coverage which has been done. Now what GSI has done is, GSI by now has completed 864 cruises within the exclusive economy zone and some cruises obviously beyond that EZA to the international water also. And this data actually in the EZ we have covered out of 21,059, uh, 21,59,622,20,42,058 almost 90, over the 92 percent. And in TW also the same type of figure is coming, which is coming there. Now what we have generated out of it is first the bathymetric map, which is there in the left-hand column, and the slope distribution map to the right, which is basically a derivative of this bathymetric map. And the sample which has been collected is the most important part because the Navy people are here, they used to use this data for other purposes. So this is the sediment distribution map which is there throughout our EZ. So this sediment distribution map is being used for exploration where the materials are present as well as from other purposes, the defense purposes and others. And this is the magnetic data, the magnetic anomaly data that has been done. These are basically the baseline data which gives us for going to the next stage of a the mineral exploration as and others. Now, the data which we have collected so far has been taken together, whatever minerals we have done, to go for the offshore prospective area, the OPA. Why this OPA is important is because we are knowing that this is the places this particular mineral exists and we have to define our exploration on that. But one thing is there, this OPA area is never sacrosanct it will be changing as our exploration process progresses. So the change of uh, this map will be there, which we'll be discussing in the later period. So in the lime mud area, these are the, these are the commodities, the OP area existing in the square kilometer and the OP area covered by us. In a high metalliferous mud, we have not covered anything right now, but in the rest of the places, we are doing it and we'll be augmenting it. And this is the map where this OPA different commodities area has been shown. This is one of the map will be showing you that how the blocks has been distributed it is not uh, very well uh, seen from the back. But this is, uh, basically the uh, OP area which, which has been draped on the top of your the sediment distribution maps. And these are the places where we are giving these blocks. We'll be discussing it in a more detail as the thing goes. Now, uh, Secretary has already told that we have given these 35 blocks as of now. And these 35 blocks is nine uh, geological memorandum from the construction sand, mostly in the Kerala. Obviously in the Kerala, both in the TW area and beyond TW, there are three blocks which is beyond TW. But uh, what is remarkable is the, um, the amount of the deposit which is 992 million tons, which is only two meter of the depth of the from below sea surface. Three lime mud uh, blocks has been given, which is amounting for 1724 million tons within the 215 square kilometer of area. This is actually covered with a six meter of the below your, uh, the uh, below seabed. Seven geological uh, memorandum has been uh, given by the polymetallic nodules crossed for the Nicobar Island and Andaman for 602. I am, uh, I am happy to tell that in other places also we have got the same type of list of these uh, polymetallic nodules and crossed in Lakhadip. This is the area where we have already done three cruises and we will be doing more cruises in the near future to augment those areas where these polymetallic nodules and crossed are there. One thing is there, it is not as enriched as for your uh, Pacific and other places which is found in the seabed, but this is near shore and easily to be extractable, what, we, what my idea is. And that's why we have given some G4 block so that this G4 block can be explored because it is mostly important for cobalt, nickel and REEs. And in Andaman there are places we get the platinum and palladium, and I have seen specks of gold also there. 
Now, 16 geological memoranda has been given for the heavy mineral places. Heavy mineral, I'll be explaining. Sarah has already told it is Rotil, Zarkan, Monazite, and others. And this has been, 16 has been given in the Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, and Odisha. And uh, 95, 80 million tons within the 1370 square kilometer of area. Now, this is what we have already uh, handed over to the Ministry of Mines for auctioning. This is basically the offshore heavy minerals, as this is the basically breakdown of these 16 blocks, 5 uh, million tons each within a water depth of 5 to 80 million meter. And this is obviously 20 kilometers from the shore. And these are the minerals which is found. 10 in the, on this breakup, 10 in the east coast, 6 in the west coast, and these are the heavy mineral layers. This is the distributions of the heavy mineral areas within the territorial water and is. Second thing is the lime mud. This total area, the area which is blocked is the lime mud basins from where the lime mud can be extracted. We have taken, because this area has been covered by us by different sampling, but in this area, we have done part of the G3 exploration by, with a two by two grid and uh, this has accounting uh, to the three of the blocks which has been niched with the 250 million tons of lime mud in the Porbandar Gujarat West Coast. The water depth is 60 to 160 meter and distance to 150 kilometer. Resource estimated up to 6 meter which was ground truth validated with the course collected. Calcium oxide 40 percent cut off with an average of 47 percent quite high. Basically, if we are not doing any processing, this can be directly used to the cement plant. But as for the IBM report, this can, with certain amount of beneficial beneficiation, it can go to their steel melting shop also. And that is being tested in a small plant in Tesco. But we, without anything, this can go directly to, the, as for the IBM, it can directly go to cement industries. The chlorine percentage is 0.321. So it is below 1% one, 1 limit, which can be used. It is only the raw material, chlorine. But if it is just one, it will be coming down to below 0.5. Coming to the construction sand, basically all in the Kerala domain. These are the places where this construction sand blocks has been given. The resource has been estimated for, for 2 meters below the seabed for 9 blocks which is actually 992 million tons. And uh, our block this uh, dimension is any block should be having a resource of 100 million tons and over. This is the area of the polymetallic nodules. This is actually the waste sea oil ridge or the waste sea oil rise in the Andaman, yeah, Andaman uh, subduction zone inside the Andaman Sea. The black points are actually the ROV locations from where we have taken the samples and getting it analyzed. Now, in the West Seal Rise in Andaman Sea, this ROV has gone and taken out the samples. One thing is the crust, which is basically a little bit of cobalt rich, and second is your A nodules, which is nickel rich. But RD is present in both the, both the places, and this is one of the ROV pictures how the nodules have been distributed over the sea and the video has already uh, given you that. So here the barium is up to 2661 ppm and this is the number, the cobalt and uh, chromium and the nickel. Nickel is quite high compared to the other and RD is also good enough to be extracted. Now what is our future? In March, 2024, we are going to give the 21 uh, probable blocks of the heavy minerals, three for the construction sand, which is in the TW, beyond the TW area, obviously in the contiguous zone. This total 24 blocks will be again uh, to be given to the Ministry of Mines for auctioning. 
Now, what is our program in 2024 and 25? Actually, we do both the mapping and the mineral exploration. Mapping is needed to identify the areas where the mineral exploration will be taken place. So, with the RV Smoda Radnakar, we are having three mapping programs and four mineral area, uh, investigation program. I'll be giving a break up how the things are. In Saudi Kama, there are four mapping and three mineral investigation. In Coast of, there are two mapping, more mineral exploration, that is five. And these other coastal items is basically through the boat survey because our ship cannot go beyond uh, 10 meters. So within that 0 to 10 meter zone, the boat survey mechanized boat used to go along with the grab samplers and others. And they collect the samples to go, go for the augmentation of the resources. Basically, the heavy minerals are coming from the beach towards the shore. So the percentage decreases, but to understand how the flow is there, that is, this is important. So this is actually in the Samudra Ratnaka, there will be two Naimar program. One Naimar program will be for G4 stage to augment it to where to go for the G3, the 2x2 two two exploration, grid exploration. Second is the polymetallic crust and nodules. There will be G4 program in Lakhadip Sea, as we have told. That is the time we have already discovered the A. Previously, the idea was it is only in the micro nodules. But uh, slightly change of our exploration strategy, we uh, come across these uh, nodules, bigger nodules, very, very big nodules over there. And then the phosphodite, as we are doing uh, right now in the Point Kalimar and uh, coastal part of the Tamil Nadu, we'll be doing this G4 exploration. And uh, there will be MCS surveys, Andaman Sea and the Arabian Sea, which is the multi-channel seismic MES. In this point, I wanted to tell thanks to the DDAs, they are giving the data to us and which we are using for the data what we have collected so far. Now for the Sumudra, Saudi Kama, there will be four uh, programs for the contiguous zone and three for the constant sand. And uh, Costa will be having five heavy mineral pressure rate uh, program and two systematic survey within the territorial water. And near shore, as I have told, to 0 to 10 meter, there will be 2A, which will be basically taken from the, uh, the Tamil Nadu. They will be doing this heavy mineral placid. This is the total in 24-25, what program will be taking. What will be our future? The future progress in GSI in the offshore beyond April 2025 will be having, having mapping in the contiguous zone to identify the systematically will be covering by two by two spacing, which we have uh, done earlier. It was by by five. So it will be uh, close grid the spacing and possible mineral occurrences, sand at HM. Sand is very important in that part because heavy mineral concentration goes down. It will be giving more sand over there. Second part is the surveys in the international water. We are doing this survey in the 90 degree east, basically for uh, going for a mapping of that area as well as for the uh, polymetallic nodules and grass present over there. There will be a G4 level exploration for the prospective delineating during the mapping clues within the explored HM, sand, lime mud, phos phosphorite, and polymetallic nodules. There will be G3 level ex exploration, which will be obviously based on the G4 level exploration and will be mounted for sand, HM, phosphorite, and lime mud. There will be as I have told earlier, the OPA area is never fixed. It goes on changing as our mount. We are mounting more program, we are getting more data. So the OPA area will be uh, freshly defined. We'll be getting a freshly OPA map for the offshore domain. And obviously the block generation and the auction, for auction. These are the two places from where the data can be downloaded free the data generated by GSI as well as in the offshore and onshore domain, that is for Bukos as well as in the NGDR. With the registration, we can download, there will be discussion over here. So uh, this data can be downloaded freely from there. And uh, people can use, use this data for generating of more blocks and more exploration projects. Before I give thank you, I should thanks one of the things because this was a long pending things in offshore domain. In the land part, we are having the G4, G3, G2, G1. 
and how the uh, exploration has been defined over there is very strictly followed over there. But unfortunately, there are uh, very less players in this uh, offshore domain, so this thing has not been defined earlier. Thanks to uh, our secretary, sir, and uh, effort from the Ministry of Mines, we have already defining these G4, G3, G2, and G1 activities in these particular rules, which will be strictly followed by the other people who will be doing the exploration in this domain. Earlier, it was not there. This will be basically giving a very good framework for doing the future exploration. Thank you very much for listening to me for a long time. Thank you very much. Any, any question, it can be uh, discussed. You can share it to me or you can discuss right now. I, said, I think, sir, we are having some to, okay. Any question or otherwise you can uh, write to hod.mnw at the rate of gsi.gov.in and we will be answering any question comes. There we can discuss. Thank you very much for listening. I have a question. Ha, sir. Suppose uh, Department of Atomic Energy is interested in a particular uh, heavy mineral and uh, they don't have an exploration agency. And they come to you and they request you and they may have some basic information that in some particular area, in some coastal area, it could be found. So can you take up a sponsored or a dedicated exploration project for uh, any ministry? Definitely, sir. Definitely will be taken. So do you get those kind of uh, requests? We have not received uh, as of now. Will be doing these activities. No, they have not tasted it yet. Yes. We have got requests for not for exploration, but for other purposes. Yes. No, sir is asking for the exploration, especially for the heavies. So, is there anyone from IREL or DAE here? Give, give him the mic. From area. So, in any of the blocks. Thank you, Basav Sahab, <coughs> for enlightening the gathering with work of GSI in offshore. GSI is working rigorously in offshore domain from past 40 years, and the fruits are now ready in the form of blocks. Under the able guidance and leadership of our Secretary Mines, we will be putting a small Bharat. With this, we will be moving to the next talk. National Center of Polar and Ocean Research, NCPR, under Ministry of Earth Science, is the India's premier R&D institution responsible for activities in polar and relief. A very good afternoon to uh, everyone. Uh, respected uh, Secretary, Sir, uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, DG, and distinguished guests. 
So today I'm going to uh, present uh, the NCPR activity, uh, mainly uh, uh, in the exclusive economic zone of this country, and uh, what are the future prospects for the mineral exploration in uh, EEZ. So uh, NCPR is the uh, nodal agency under the agency of the Ministry of Earth Science for implementation of the EEZ program mapping. Uh, along with uh, National Institute of Ocean Technology, National Institute of Oceanography, and Geological Survey of India. NCPR is mainly uh, carrying out the EZ mapping program in the deeper waters, that is more than 500 meter depth water. And in the shallow region, NIOT and NIO are carrying out the mapping. And GSI is partner in both the exploration activities uh, in the mapping uh, areas. So the major objective of the program is to prepare a comprehensive seabed topographic map of the entire EZ of India by using multi-beam uh, ecosystem, eco-sounder, creation of marine geoscientific database, and evaluating the geohazard potentials in the Indian margin. <coughs> so, so far we have almost completed nearly 85% of the deep area uh, has been mapped and uh, uh, and uh, all the, already uh, the data has been shared. So what we have, the current state is that we are now making the charts. So we are made preparing the bathymetric charts and it is in ongoing uh, collaboration with the GSI using coarser re uh, resolution data. And also uh, NCPR has developed a marine geoscientific database which actually contains all the data which is include raw, processed, interpreted and uh, so far we have almost uh, uh, 15 terabyte of data and we are in the process of upgrading it and uh, this data has already been shared to GSI also and uh, we are in continuous touch with them on sharing of this data. So what we discover? So after uh, I, uh, analyzing this bathymetric uh, data, so we have discovered a lot of major morphological features and uh, such as the sea mounts, canyons, channels, submarine landslides. So I'm going to talk today on specifically on the sea mounts. So in the west coast of India, we have almost identified 40 uh, uh, newly identified features, which are uh, sea mounts, uh, girds, then uh, plateaus. So you can see uh, they have at different elevations. And uh, as we all know that Sea mounts are very unique uh, morphological features because it controls also it is having an impact on the ocean circulations as well as it is also having a ecosystem benthic habitat around them. And one of the importance of the sea mount is they host the cobalt crust. So uh, you can uh, see that in the west coast of, uh, of uh, this is the west coast of map and where we have identified a lot of such features in the West Coast, and uh, many of the features are the first time we had uh, actually discovered. Uh, so the tallest hill is up to, uh, that is from the bottom, uh, the uh, water depth is 400 meters, so almost we got to 2,500 uh, height mountains in the Western Coast. <coughs> So as I mentioned that why sea mounts are so important. So basically they host the cobalt rich ferromanganese crust and they are as already uh, from the morning we have heard that they are highly enriched in metals like cobalt, tellurium, tungsten, zircon, platinum, rare earths and so far no land deposits of tellurium is there in the world. So cobalt in sea mount is almost three to ten times more enriched than the primary land deposits and cobalt up to 2%, platinum up to 0.001% and rare earths are besides uh, which nickel and manganese also there. And we know the end uses. So nowadays the, they are being used in jet engines, special magnets, electronics and tellurium in semiconductors, solar cells, electronics, memory chips. So it has having a huge potential economic importance. And the important thing is that ferromanganese crust, how they actually form. So basically to form a ferromanganese crust, you need a sedimentary hard substrate, so which actually sea mounts provide because 
because of the elevation due to current effects, these substrates are quite relatively free from uh, sediments. And there should be availability of large pool of dissolved manganese and iron. And it also requires oxygenated ambient water. And these conditions normally occurs on tectonically stable ge uh, geologically old seamounts. And how they form? So basically they form, if you see the, in the ocean column at the, just above the uh, oxygen minimum, in the oxygen minimum zone, these free anions, the cations are available like manganese, copper and all. Once they are interacted with the oxygenated water, so they forms the manganese negatively charged oxides and they started actually scavenging all these metals. So copper, lead, zinc, together with like same, similarly the iron uh, oxyhydroxides. And then subsequently they basically get precipitated on the ocean, uh, on the seamount tops or in the flanks. And we could see that occurring, uh, these seamounts can occur in all seamounts, uh, all, all over the worlds and mostly they are hydrogenous, but sometimes they also get inputs from the hydrothermal. And uh, if you see uh, the, the world's cobalt rich ferromagnese crust, uh, they occur uh, almost from 400 to 5000 meter depth. And the prime crust zone is one of the zone which has actually have 7533 million tons of cobalt crust in that zone. And this is oxygen uh, 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 map of the world. And as, we, as I mentioned that oxygen minimum zone is one of the uh, criteria uh, for formation of this crust. So in the central region, we could see that there is a huge potential in the prime crust zone, but such uh, exploration has never been uh, carried out in the Arabian Sea and the west coast of India. And which is also one of the, uh, out of the five oxygen minimum zones, one of the zone is in the uh, uh, Arabian Sea. So there is a, uh, we feel that there is a potentiality for this cobalt crust in these areas and this need to be explored further. So what we are expecting the possible collaborations and way forward with the GSI is that the first thing we need to prepare a high resolution mapping of selected sea mounts which uh, in the western offshore region and then we have to do a systematic bulk sampling using rock dredge and then we have to do the detailed geochemical studies because we have to understand the enrichment of the metals and then we have to carry out the focus sampling through TV graph systems so that we can uh, make the contour, uh, uh, the zones in a grid pattern, uh, we can sample this uh, cobalt crust. And then we have to identify the zones of high metal concentration. And finally, we can make a, a resource evaluation. So this we feel that uh, NCPUR will definitely would uh, like to work and collaborate with GSI in these areas. So thank you for your patient here. Uh, usually, sir, it is mainly based on the area. I Means first we have to identify the sam uh, the bulk sampling will give us the area of a uh, potential, potential areas, and then further, if we want, then we can start with the one kilometer grid. So one kilometer by one kilometer grid over a sea mount can be through a grab sampling with the TV grab, and then we can actually able to uh, evaluate the uh, resource. And it, and also one of the key parameters is the thickness of the crust. So there we have to understand how it is actually the thickness. So that one uh, step is we have to do the, uh, uh, this bulk sampling only. And uh, still so far not much geophysics has been used in that, but uh, if through some tools uh, we can at least assess the thickness, then of the crust. So. No, sir, because they usually below the crust, it is a uh, basaltic rocks basalt. or, yeah, mostly basalts because the sea mounts are the hills of magmatic origin. So mostly, yeah. Yes, if any volcanic activity happens, then sudden uh, coverage can over, can come in the clastic zones, but 
usually to form this uh, cobalt crust, you need a very undisturbed zones. So that are, that's the reason we found that in many of the areas, uh, in these seamounts, they are only cobalt crusts are there. Uh, no, sir, we have not yet sampled and not yet uh, analyzed. So this is the key area which we feel that we should move ahead uh, to explore the offshore, uh, the seamounts. Everything is within our EZ. Uh, no, sir, we, uh, there are seamounts in the beyond EZ also. There is a place called Afinis in Ikitin Seamount, which is there. But since we are mapped, our uh, uh, bathymetric mapping is completely in the EZ. So with that data, we have so far identified these features. Hello. Yeah. Can go at any resolution. As so most, uh, again, we have to go for this uh, high resolution studies. So these uh, high resolution maps are based on the 100 uh, meter resolution, 100 to 150 meter resolution. So if we really want to understand the actual uh, the features, how they are there and all, so then we further we have to go with the more better resolution. So that's what means with the high resolution mapping. So that can be based through AUVs or some other autonomous underwater vehicles. So that can be achieved. Okay, thank you. Can you explain a little bit uh, about the tellurium? Kilo year. Oh. Uh, so actually, they form the the growth rate is even the slower than the nodules. They form one millimeter to five millimeter in one million year. So it's extremely so, uh, slow process which is happening in the ocean. So uh, almost. Uh, to form a crust of almost a one centimeter, it is almost uh, five to 10 million years scale. The, the, the location you told in the West Coast, where is the location? Yeah. Yeah. So we have not uh, uh, determined the, so this is the complete West Coast map. So you can see here, so a lot of seamounts are there. So this has not been dated yet. So. But their formation ages are since, so this, this whole zone is a, uh, you can say from, we can get uh, from uh, million years of. Yeah, yeah, correct. So these seamounts have been identified all through these areas. No, 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 the, the, the location of the tellurium. Look. You told us you located some tellurium. Uh, no, sir, we, we have not located, sir. These are no. the potential areas for the uh, exploration for tellurium. So we have to look into that. So we have not so far even, we have not uh, identified the mineral enrichment also. So these are the possible zones, probable zones, which we need to now explore. And uh, we hope that some of the seamounts will be highly economical and which can be the future uh, resource. So that's what uh, I'm uh, presenting here. So. Hello. Uh, uh, you said that you have uh, mostly acquired the bathymetry data of these. What is the typical resolution of that? It's so a 100 meter resolution, almost. And when you say you need more higher re resolution, then what are you looking for? What kind of... Uh, uh, so uh, this high resolution will uh, able to map those seamounts in a proper way for the slopes and uh, uh, the actual curves and how, and then uh, it will help us to understand the encrustation process. So. Yeah, yes, so sir. Are you looking for still finer resolution? 
right now we are not looking for such. So uh, with this resolution, we could identify now these features, so which can be taken up now and wherever something will come up, some economic potential that can be looked further for the high resolution. I have a question. So the next step for you is to do sampling. Go to the last slide with a way forward. Next step for you is to take some samples and do some geochemical studies. Yes, sir. So you can do that or you want someone else to do it for you? Uh, sir, if JSI uh, will collaborate us, we can both do that. But the analysis part, like we have the NCPR has the full capability of analyzing this crust at our laboratories. So if we get Yes, in that uh, uh, we can, both so we can collaborate is, and. If it is in the root of some. I don't know who is good at that, but how do we collect the sample is the question. Sir, basically what we talking about the lacrative leakage where PMI has delivered the FMN already. So basically these areas has already been has been brief, a good brief. Okay. I think it, yeah, my, my voice is audible. No, 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 it is not audible. My cue is <laughs> So, this ADS, sir, was already, we are scanning over there. Actually, earlier the thought was it is only micronodules. In my presentation, I have told, because GSI got only in a single cruise, a single a nodule in one of the crews taken by earlier years. So, that was one of the things to identify when I was there. I told that there should be bigger say, samples over there. So instead of normal uh, sampling device, we go, got for the speed coder over there. So we got the samples along with the woods. Actually, uh, if you are drag over there, if the sampling process is not proper, this nodule goes away. And these samples is being analyzed in the JSI lab. <laughs> ICPMS is there in our Vizag lab. We are analyzing these samples. We are in this process. So if they are wanting to join with us, they are welcome, sir. The way we are joining to their uh, mission. Basab, have you analyzed any encrustation so far? Yes. Encrustation, so cobalt is, I think, two percent. So that is yes. not two percent. I think point two. Point two percent. Two thousand ppm, na? Point two. No, crust is always increased in cobalt and uh, nodules are increased in nickel, but a little bit of enrichment more. But both are having RD, which is more important also. No, if you, if they want to join, no, this meeting is to ensure that everyone joins together. No, they can. They okay, they so can you work together. with them. Huh. Maybe you can share your information with them. Maybe there's that they have which you can uh, pick up. And let us see what is, what can be found in these uh, mounts. Actually, sir, this mount top is actually having phosphorides. Initially, earlier days, people used to go for the phosphorized exploration on the top of this mount. Actually, this phosphatization is one part over which usually this FEMN uh, nodule comes. But different uh, area, but the time is there on the phosphorization takes place. So we can we can always work, sir. And we are, in fact, we are working together in yes, many sir. of the places. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have one question. Uh, sir. I have one question. Uh, so, how many sea modes have been sampled so far in uh, Lakhdiv region? Small mounds are there. There are uh, four. Yeah, in fact, four. Uh, actually, you know, in uh, Dr. Parja's presentation, we have mapped around 23 sea mounds in Lakhdiv region. Sir. So, it's more than four sea mounds. There are many that more sea mounds. I am, I am telling that we can collaborate. Out of the four mount, if other mounts 
sir, president, we can go and go over there. Uh, sir, that is what I am telling, sir, actually. That's why I don't know. Not only four CM amounts, so uh, around 23 CM amounts have been mapped using we need to have cooperative PSA. So we wanted to work together so that Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parizat Roy, for sharing the work of uh, NCPR in offshore domain. But, uh, sir has uh, told about mapping of EEZ, chart preparation, marine geoscientific database, discovery of morphological feature, formation of uh, ferromagnetic crust and nodules on uh, sea mounds. So I hope that our audience has been uh, highlighted with, here, with the work of NCPR moving forward. National Institute of Ocean Technology, NIOT, under Ministry of Earth Science, aims to develop a reliable indigenous technology to solve the various engineering problems associated with the harvesting non-living and living resources in the offshore domain. I request Dr. Gopakumar K, Scientist G, to make audience aware of activities of NIOT in offshore. Sir, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start on what I think, I'll just give a brief overview of the institute where I'm coming from because many here may not be aware of the National Institute of Ocean Technology at Chennai. We are not very old. Uh, we are just November 1993 young. Uh, it's the first autonomous institute under the Ministry of Earth Sciences, then called as the Department of Ocean Development. And that is what gave impetus to a lot of the ocean research and uh, impetus into ocean technology because there are a lot of people who talk of science, exploration, e survey, but there were very, le very less uh, institutes of people working in ocean technology, that's where we came in. We have a very uh, clear mandate to develop reliable indigenous technologies and to solve uh, various engineering problems, both for harvesting living as well as non-living resources. And you could see that one of the focus we have on that is about sustainable in these activities because uh, the, the resources will be there, they are less, but we still has to be sustainable and utilization. We also intend pro uh, providing valued technical services and solutions. In fact, some discussions have already happened, some will happen more, where you would find there are actually engineering problems which you encounter. And we also intend to develop a knowledge base and institutional capabilities, not uh, only with us, but also with our sister institutions. We work very closely with National Ocean, uh, Oceanography Goa. NCPR is already a sister organization working on the PMS, and we also have a CSR lab uh, working with us on metallurgy. Our focus areas, apart from uh, what I would be presenting, is principally on renewable energy. We have work going on waves, currents, water column, temperature gradient, desalination, using a very old but traditional method, but still uh, very cheap and effective. Uh, desalination using the low thermal temperature, thermal desalination. We have been working on six of the Lakshadweep Islands, uh, and very, uh, very well appreciated. We also look at, we are a big, in a big way into technology development for deep sea exploration with submersibles, both uh, first we are with unmanned, now we are also going into manned. And this is where I work in the technology development for deep sea mining. Uh, ocean observation systems extensively, uh, it's, it's a data driven uh, field. Auto we have autonomous, mode boys, drifters, aerial drones. The aerial drones are something new that we are working upon. And uh, as it happens, coastal observation, shore protection, beach restoration are very, very valuable to our coastal communities. And to make all this happen, uh, the only thing that works underwater is acoustics, ocean acoustics. We are working along with other sister organizations also. And we also have a marine bi microbial biotechnology and open sea culture, open uh, sea cage culture for fishing. We have our main campus in Chennai and a, a satellite campus in Port Blair and Nellore. So if you look at what I have said just now, it essentially covers the blue economy spectrum of uh, the government, uh, from uh, vehicles to desalination, ocean observation, and climate change, which directly and indirectly affects all of us. I will uh, touch upon only three of them, though I have covered a lot of them. I will cover only three of them for this particular workshop. 
ocean observation systems, uh, mode uh, by network, submersibles, manned submersible development is currently going on, ROVs and AUV, and uh, deep sea mining with a focus on polymetal nodules. Now to just get an overview that uh, where uh, and what we are speaking about, you have uh, some defined resources in the EZ and you have certain resources outside our EZ. In the EZ, we have gas hydrates, while we are talking about ocean sea uh, mineral sand, etc. We also have gas hydrates, which is a uh, resource, a fuel, fossil fuel resource uh, in the KG basin. Uh, apart from that, uh, credits to GSI for sharing information with us that uh, there are cobalt crust and nodules. Uh, concurrently present in Andaman seas. Uh, then we have uh, uh, cobalt crust potential uh, south of Sri Lanka in the FSNE Nikitan Seamount, which is actually an uh, area we also, where India is also looking at for applying. It is not under the EZ, it's in the uh, open ocean conditions under the jurisdiction of the International Seabed Authority. We have the polymer nodules, which are uh, under survey exploration, we have 75,000 square kilometers given to India for exploration, not for exploitation. And we also have hydrothermal sulfides, uh, thousand square kilometers that which NCPR has been uh, pursuing and trying to uh, understand where the uh, resources are and what is the prospect of actually mining. So if you look at it, it's quite far from India. Uh, I've, uh, for those who can read it, uh, I have given the distance also how far it is from the closest port in mainland India. Now, now, this is what actually defines how you go about doing the mining operations. Now, before you go for mining operations, I want to cover about ocean observation systems because though some of you may feel how does ocean observation systems and mining and prospecting have any link because uh, unless you know the ocean state conditions, you cannot actually plan your operations. And most important uh, of that is about environmental impact assessment. There are very few tools to understand annual impact assessment are then through mode buys because you have to get your baseline. While you can do instant sampling through your uh, occasional interventions with the ROV or a AUV, but you still require a long-term baseline data for which ocean observation systems or mode buys becomes very, very important. Apart from that, we've also been using it for uh, cyclone uh, tsunami early warning. We are the institute which actually specializes in that and we, the data goes to in our system, uh, institute in Kois in Hyderabad which is actually shows the tsunami warning whenever it happens. We also have been tracking the cyclones and you can see with the colored uh, map here how we have been tracking it wherever it has happened over the last uh, year plus and this has given us a lot of confidence in developing a different types of boys which for different applications. You have some which for the deep waters we call as omni boys. We have the tsunami boys, a different design and we have something different for the coastal waters. And most of the discussions here would be for coastal waters as we go on. Uh, we had uh, ROV developed jointly with the Russian uh, collaboration uh, uh, quite some time back. And this was a deep water ROV which we have christened as ROSUB 6000. Uh, we had tested it uh, extensively and we also use it in our polymer nodules and the PMS, polymetal sulfides uh, zones that we have been given by the ISA. Uh, it is principally for deep uh, sea mineral exploration. It is more like a uh, microscope than a telescope. Uh, we also, using the experience, we developed a 500 meter ROV, which we had called as Pro V500. Very good for uh, depths up to 500 meters and coastal observation, etc. This has been successfully transferred, technology transferred to two of the companies, LNT and Bharat Electric Electronics Limited, who, on a non exclusive basis. That means if the third person wants to come, he also can be given this technology. And these are some of the uh, samples. Uh, so this is the pro ROV, 500, uh, 500 meters depth. This is what is date for 6,000 meters. Only thing this requires extensive launching and handling system. This can also be launched by hand on a boat or something. So it's much more flexible. We have uh, autonomous underwater vehicle procured two years back uh, from Konsberg Maritime Norway, which is uh, used uh, for deep ocean, sorry, which is being used for deep ocean scientific research. Uh, we are still getting our, uh, uh, coming to grips of handling it because we have the Norwegians helping us. But over the next few years, we expect us to be competent enough to actually do the survey alone and actually do the data analysis also. This has been used over the last, uh, as you can see, the survey experience. We have used extensively for the last couple of years uh, in the COB, Central Indian Ocean for the Polymetric Nodule Survey, where we have to do the mining intervention on the seabed. We also used the gas hydrates last year. And 
uh, it was it will be used for the hydrogen survey in the coming year, in the, this year also and for those of you who have actually been abreast of the newspapers we also uh, providentially found a aircraft which had crashed in the bay of bengal indian air force aircraft and we were able to pick it up it was a closure for those families who had lost and the good thing about this AUV is that it is it's a containerized system. It doesn't it it can be used on any ship of opportunity. It need not that it has to be specific to a particular ship only. So if tomorrow you have another ship, Sagar Ratnakar, you can put it there also. If you want to have a different ship, you can put on that ship also. And it is rated for six kilometers with a good endurance of 48 hours. This is something that we are working on presently, a manned submersible where we can send three people uh, to the uh, in the vessel to the bottom of the place, uh, bottom of the ocean, 6,000 meters, which is generally the deepest for most of the oceans, and then you want to go into a trench. So uh, this can withstand a pressure of 600 bar, and it's made of titanium alloy. I know many of you may be thinking about the accident that was there a few months back. This is not made of a fiber or a composite metal, it's made of titanium alloy grade 5. So this is under development, and we hope to send a pilot and two scientific crew in a shut sleeve environment. Means you don't require any specialized training. A scientific crew need not have any specialized training to go to the bottom of the sea in this particular uh, vessel. The pilot will be trained. Others can be simple scientists like you and me who want to go down and actually do some scientific visual work or, and sampling. It has got three viewports because if you want to do with cameras, you are always have ROV. You don't have to go down in a manned submersible. So it has viewports actually where you can go, see, observe and make your own evaluation and assessment. The applications where, that we intend to use is certainly the PMN because that is where the whole uh, the requirements that come from, the PMN, PMS and the CRC, cobalt rich curse. We also intend using at the gas hydrate sites for the various methane seeps which keep coming out and have observation. We also intend doing extensive uh, mapping of the hydrothermal vents which is where most manned submersibles have found use because there is a separate ecosystem with, uh, which is present. Uh, with extreme biodiversity and all active thermal uh, uh, hydrothermal vents. There's also a lot of interest in uh, looking at wrecks uh, which have been forgotten. And the last one, the submarine cable inspection, a very innocuously written term, but it has got a lot of strategic value also. Now, before we go to the deep sea mining, as an engineer, I require to know where my system has to intervene, what it has to do, how much is collect. So, the, all the three uh, resources, that is polymer nodules, massive uh, seafloor mass sulfur, that is PMS, and cobalt crust have different morphological uh, place, uh, presence that you cannot use one system which you use for PMN into PMS or for CRC, that is cobalt rich crust. So if the first thing that comes out is the depth. PMN is generally at a much higher depth, 4,000 to 6,000 meters. Potato sized nodules, so it could be 5 mm, it could be 80 mm. So the size also makes a lot of difference because you cannot pump slurry of a very huge uh, size difference. It is unstable. Now, there is a lot of fauna which is resistant, which also brings a lot of resistance because there is an environmental damage that you are doing because you are intervening there. And these are all undisturbed uh, areas of the world. Millions of years, nobody has gone there and done any interference and no permanent changes to those environment. Seafloor sulfites, uh, similar problem, they occur from as low as probably uh, 800 to 1000 meters to as deep as 4000 meters. There, and the, as per the convention, you cannot intervene in an area where there are active hydrothermal vents. You can only go and do work where there are no active thermal vents. And it could be as a chimney or it could be with a lot of overburden. So the mining intervention requires to address these issues which are present there. With cobalt plus, like a lot of discussions already happened, it, these are rich, very hard, rich crusts which are on the flanks or on the tabletop, that is on the top of a plateau. And any plateau or a seamount that many of you would have mapped are never regular smooth surfaces, they are highly jagged. In fact, even the Andaman Nicobar uh, find is, is extensively jagged and uneven. You, you cannot have one type of machine suiting for that. And here you, in, on a cabal crust probably you have to actually uh, break crush system. Then you want to break crush system, the system has to be very, very heavy. And one other thing that actually goes a little, uh, uh, little on the negative side of cobalt rich crust is that it is very close to the surface, that is very close to the footing zone. So if you have a lot of debris, a lot of plumes, a lot of uh, damage or uh, debris being created on the footing zone, which is actually a most productive zone of the 
uh, water layer, you are actually may attract attention of the environmentalists because that is you may have a problem with your fisheries, etc. Uh, incidentally, I want to give credit to these photos. These two photos are the last. These are uh, uh, shared by GSI, which I have put here so that you can understand uh, the type of uh, nodules and the type of crust that is also present. Now, these are the nodules of the Indian Ocean, which is at 5,500 meters. It's on a very soft sediment. There is not a single rock there. There is no hard crust there. It's just potato nodules thrown on a very soft sediment. Whereas here, it is a very shallow ooze. You, you may not call it as a sediment, just a shallow ooze on a very hard substrate. Typically, a mining system, uh, any seabed, whether it's CRC, PMS, or uh, PMN, would have these essential components, a ship on the surface, which, can, which has to be dynamically positioned. That means it will not change its heading or position. And it has to move with the miner, because there is a, there is a limit on the length of your system that is connected to it. Now, it has to be stable, it has to withstand the ocean conditions present at that spot. The difference, there is a lot of difference between a coastal mining and there's a lot of difference between open ocean mining. Both, it's, the whole physics is very different. And it also has to have some interim storage requirements. So obviously it can't be a small ship, even Sagar Atnakar is too small by those definitions. It has to have an onboard collection system in the sense that when you collect, you have to throw, you have to keep the material with you and throw the debris outside. And as for environment rules and regulations and also the norms which the act, the OAMDR Act may also have these incorporated. You can't just throw it randomly into the water. Wastewater disposal is a serious environmental compliance issue. Depth, because the depth is so much, if the depth could be 600 meters or the depth could be 4,000 meters, you still have to run a power cable from top to bottom. And when you run a power cable and that to powers which goes into many hundreds of kilowatts and many and many megawatts, it is it has uh, power distortions. This has to be addressed. So the cable that you use is designed separately, the power system that you design are designed separately and uniquely. And these are not available off the shelf. The most critical of, of all things is the, the pipeline which connects your uh, collection system at the seabed to the ship on the surface. If you're on a shallow water, you have the example of dredging. Dredging has, is as probably as old as uh, 100, 120 years. Because you have been dredging in, uh, in uh, shallow waters, you've also been dredging in uh, not so shallow waters. But there you can use a flexible hose, you can use a rubber hose. But when you go for very high depths, you have to use a steel pipe. And this philosophy comes from our, uh, from our uh, experience from the oil and gas, deep water oil and gas, where you have to use a steel pipe to transport petroleum from the uh, seabed to the top. Fortunately, in the case of oil and gas, it comes under pressure. You don't have to pump it. But unfortunately, in the case of mining, you have to pump it. You have to create that uh, energy, kinetic energy, to put it from the seabed to the top with the unstable system of a slurry, which has got different sizes of particles, including sediments. And the last and the most important comes, of course, is the seabed mining machine on the seabed. The terrain, the type of the resource, whether it's a PMN or a PMS or a CRC, that defines what is your mining machine about. If it's simply nodules on a very soft sediment, you can collect it as potatoes. It, it could be like your golf ball collector or it could be as, well as, as simple as your potato harvester in, which we had in the earlier uh, so, uh, Soviet bloc European countries. But if it is not that, you really have to pulverize, break these crusts or even these chimneys or even this overburden into smaller particles and pump it up. So there is a factory which you have to set up down below this factory is not small. This factory could be as big as, while our machine is just few, uh, just a 10 tons, it could be as high as 100 tons of machinery just on the seabed. So it's a different philosophy when you, and the scale. If you're looking at a small scale, it may not be economical, but if you want to go for very high scale, where you are breaking even, it could be in millions of tons per year. What work we have done in this field, we have been in this for the last nearly 15 years, uh, developing a system, because we also have been learning as much as all of us here have been learning. And uh, we had put up a mining machine on the seabed in depths of 5,270 meters in 2021. And we have been uh, trying to escalate it to uh, local collection and pumping so that we get a lot of confidence because we are developing a mining machine, then we want to go to a riser system and then eventually to the ship. Our final objective is to do a pilot demonstration of nodule collection and slurry pumping from depths of 6,000 meters or from the depth of 5,500 meters, we have proved in 2021 up from 500 meters using a flexible uh, hose, but that was in calm waters near to the coast of 
uh, Agri Bank or uh, of Ratnagiri. But the waters are come. But when you go to the deep ocean with a lot of swells and disturbance and unpredictability of the weather conditions, those same replica of the model of 100 meters cannot be applied there. And we also intend with our uh, revision of our uh, 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 the way we have been working, we have revised the thing that what we make pilot demonstration, we want to make it scalable because while we may work at 10, uh, 10 to uh, 60 tons per hour, this eventually if tomorrow in fact industry comes, he wants to take out the over, he should be able to scale it up to 200, 300 tons per hour eventually. That is what we have been looking at. Just to give you what is happening in the contemporary field outside, because uh, not many, uh, deep sea mining has not yet been uh, given the commercial go. So there is still a lot of work going on in development. So this is, a, uh, this is the maturity level of the contemporary technology for PMN presently existing. Collection quantity, the scale looked at is about one and a half to three million tons per year with one system. So if you want uh, anything more than this, you have to go for multiple systems then. The sledded transport, is definitely a mining machine or seabed with a steel riser for such depths and the pumping is what now is being looked at. Some are comfortable with airlift systems, some are comfortable with distributed pumping systems, some are comfortable with single pump systems. All these are in experiment stages. Somebody has some approved the airlift but it is highly power intensive. Uh, uh, the range of 23 to 30 megawatts which is substantially very high and doesn't make it economical. Platform, uh, yes, a small platform will not work. It is something akin to a drill ship that has to be looked at if you want to go for the scales of one and a half to three million tons per year. And there have been uh, two companies who have been taking lead in this regard. One is a Belgian company, other is a Canadian company. And of course, the mining machine has to be customized for the application of resource that is looking at. Cobalt crust will be different from polymer nodules, will be different from the PMS. Just to sum up uh, towards the last so that the discussions can be there, what are the opportunities? I, uh, though we were looking at, though the discussion here is more confined to the EZ uh, aspect of the resources, I am giving a little different also because this is an opportunity for India specifically if there are some industry sitting here. As of today, there is no, uh, there is no uh, permission given for commercial exploitation in international waters for any mineral resource, whether it is PMN, PMS or CRC. But it is expected that within the couple of years, there is a very strong possibility that there will be a exploitation code implemented by the International Civil Authority for PMN. Okay. When this happens, rest will follow in uh, natural progression. Uh, why this, this impetus or this interest is coming? Principally because there is a lot of demand for EV metals. And as, as you would have seen from the previous slide, uh, the polymer nodules are known as the EV resource, cobalt, nickel and copper. Though, uh, though uh, rare earths are being told in different uh, connotations, but it has rare earth as a byproduct or it may have, but the principal uh, metals of interest are cobalt, nickel and copper. And that is what is what is required for increased urbanization and extensive electrification. And as we march towards renewable energy uh, dependency, it these minerals will be required. There is a lot of opportunity for collaboration to take up the initiative to scale up to commercial mining not only with Indian collaborators, but also with foreign collaborators. And the most interesting part is, in case uh, anybody is here, which is not directly related with mining, with uh, marine mining is, a lot of the companies who want to go ahead with commercial mining tomorrow, that is within the next two years, they all want to bring their resource to India, because there was, till few years back, China was their most preferred destination. Till few years back, even Canada and Mexico was a preferred destination. But over the last few months, there is a lot of interest looking at India as a prospective place where they can get this resource after harvesting. So we need not wait for the minerals to be harvested by us. The metallurgy or the metallurgy based industry or the heavy industry can look at using this opportunity to invest and collaborate because the value added products that you can generate from there is phenomenal. Interestingly, there is a project in Europe going on called the VAMOS project, V-A-M-O-S, where the same marine uh, mining technology they are using inland. There have been a lot of cases where the mines have got flooded with water because you started mining below the water table and there was a flooding of the mines. So this same concept without the rigors of such expensive equipment you can use for inland mining also, where the water table is much higher. And uh, they have been using barges and improvised cranes for this application in a very extensive way. Submersibles, development of submersible, open to collaboration, requirements, specifications, because we have been using all stakeholders to participate to and give the requirements. We also had a workshop last year from which we have taken the uh, thing to, to see that all payloads that we have meet somebody or other's requirements, scientific as well as operational. 
and met ocean data like i said in the beginning uh, we have a lot of expertise on uh, putting these mode boys of various depths various combinations in the cyclonic area in the most uh, high current area and and we go for this when we go for this commercial mining in our ez also we we'll require this data because finally you have to say whether you are polluting this area or not how would you do that you require some mode stations where you can put these sensors whether it's a stability sensor with the current meter whether the sediment traps to verify whether this mining is within the standard specified because when you define this act you also have to define the standard how do you validate the standards are correct so you require these sort of things so we are the go to people to, for that where we can give you the technology we can also help you deploy and we can also be actually your knowledge partner for these things with this i will end my presentation any questions So we have not fully made the system yet because we are still getting the components integrated. Uh, first stage is to stage stage one is to test, we have build a sphere out of iron iron alloy, not the titanium alloy, which we can deploy at 500 meters and test it. All the components will be for 6000 meters, but the sphere alone will be for 500 meters. While the titanium alloy sphere is still being constructed and built, it will be fully manned. So three people can go inside. Commercially available outside. I mean, some private uh, companies has already developed, used. So, what are the companies? Can you name yes, them? Yes. Uh, so, for deep sea mining, there is no company yet. Sir. For deep sea mining, there is no company yet. When I said deep sea mining, I'll finish. I, I, I go. For deep sea mining, when I said it is beyond thousand meters or even beyond five hundred meters. Lot of diamond mining has been going on off Botswana, where. Uh, the mo in fact most of the diamonds that you buy today all come from marine mining so the whole uh, sea coast the western coast of botswana you have debates uh, doing this uh, diamond mining their depths there vary from 80 meters to about 120 meters and they do they do brute uh, scale pumping where they have huge pumps which suck up rocks which are as big as 80 mm and the same company that gave the solution that is ihc uh, royal ihc have also done this inland mining in uh, in uk otherwise you had lot of dredging improvisations like you had tin mining in indonesia so this has been going for uh, for ages i think there are some uh, exploration companies which are present here today so if uh, any uh, th these are basically exploration companies which do uh, onshore exploration if some of some of these people want to get into offshore exploration then you can handhold them and you can be the first point of contact where they can understand what technology is available in the country and you know outside the country in doing basic exploration because we want to open up offshore exploration also private sector secondly i think whenever we do auction whichever company takes up the offshore mine will require this kind of hand holding as to what technology available within the country and what they can develop together so we had done about 10 years back some auction not exactly auction some allocation of offshore mines to some companies they are all now in litigation nothing has happened much you mean to say that none of these companies have approached you to you know share some technology transfer of technology co development of technology you know by indian companies sir uh, uh, there is a uh, if if i may slightly uh, disagree uh, in terms of definition generally exploration what is done is that you use uh, uh, surface bathymetry tools or you actually put rovs down below or you put Uh, AUVs to actually so you take you take do a rough mapping of the resource from the top then you do a uh, local sampling with grabs or uh, sediment corers or thing and then you go for a close seabed intervention with a AUV like what we did for our mining thing so what you did from 5 uh, kilometers on top you are able to do at 30 meters close to the seabed 
but that is for resource estimation resource uh, thing we are not involved in that principally because we have a sister organization who does that nio goa under csir who does this resource uh, mapping for us for pmn and ncpr has this for the pms that is the sulfides so those companies would actually benefit more if they actually join these two institutions more we would be actually coming in after they have estimated the resource and they come for engineering solution to actually extract those resources so we would ask them in the sense that where does it happen what is abundance is is the terrain what is the type of grid of terrain because many times the terrain you have the resource but the terrain is such that you, it's not mineable so there is one of the thing is for example in polynodes is a gradient less than 2 degrees if it is more than 2 degrees then the mineability becomes a problem so so these are the questions so in fact i had a slide i didn't put it up here we look at what is abundance what is the distribution of those abundance uh, what is the uh, thing is it soft sediment is it hard rock are there any jagged projections there so these are the questions that has to be answered by those people who are ex doing the survey on which i will make engineering solution out of that when we when we do as i said we have a target of 2 3 months to do the auction of uh, offshore mines so whenever i do the auction the prospective companies all of them i am going to send to you you handle them okay sure sir okay good presentation sir. thank you sir thank you sir for making the audience aware of activities of niot in the offshore sir has put a light on ocean observation systems submersibles deep sea mining techniques uh, with this i would like to move forward national center of coastal resource research under ministry of earth science is envisaged to develop and improve country's capabilities in addressing the challenges problem prevailing in the coastal zone which have societal economical and environmental implications i request dr v ramanathan scientist e to enlighten the gathering with activities of nccr in coastal zone thank you sir good afternoon uh, respected secretary moyam dg gsi experts my colleagues and all other participants myself uh, ramanathan from nccr looking after the coastal process and shoreline management group of nccr basically i am a mathematician numerical my dom other domains expertise are numerical modeling remote sensing and gis thanks to my director dr ramana murthy who could not attend this meeting because of some preoccupied uh, works and uh, asked me to attend this meeting this is good opportunity for me to share our uh, knowledge data and other things also with the gsi and other uh, institutions national center for coastal research established during 1998 with the name of uh, integrated coastal and marine area management then after 2018 it was renamed as national center for coastal research with the mandate to promote research addressing coastal issues like uh, ecosystem services erosion pollution hazards and coastal vulnerability this shows the some of the wide spectrum of our activities under shoreline management marine spatial planning marine pollution and the ecosystem services we have interaction and cooperation with uh, central government agencies state government departments 
interministerial and international bodies to address coastal issues and doing R&D activities. After today's seminar, on the top left where you have written central government, you had Ministry of Mines. Yes. Which is not there currently. That we will put, sir. Okay. It is a, it is a past slide only yeah. that I have not updated that. But sure, sir. Apart from our Chennai campus, we have campus at uh, Vaisak. Jointly with the... Uh, you have to quickly move. Yeah, yeah, please. We are short of time. And we have another campus at Mandabam, exclusively studying the status of coral reefs and restoring activities. One of the major program of ministry as well as NCCR is marine pollution. We had a very old program, seawater quality monitoring, with uh, about 30 years of data we are uh, archiving and updating every year with the collecting the water samples from 50 locations from the shore that is 0.5 kilometer and 1 kilometer and 2 kilometer and 5 kilometer also. It is about uh, uh, 20, more than 24 parameters water samples were analyzed and assess the quality of water. This is not only supporting to CPCBs and State Pollution Control Board and we are giving this, uh, sharing the data to the uh, Ministry of Environment and Forest like uh, uh, and also under the SDG that is Sustainable Development Goal under UNEP program uh, that data also showed for the national indicator. Under this coastal habitats and ecosystem, we are doing coastal resource assessment and management, resilience indicators for major ecosystems, then ecosystem-based approaches in climate change, adaptation and disaster risk reduction, then ecosystem services. In this, we have identified some of the locations for ecosystem restoration and uh, critical Coastal Biogeo Information System for 105 locations we have identified for that. That uh, CBIS is nothing but collecting all the information in one platform without uh, uh, going for other uh, agencies or something. We have collected all the available details in one system. That is Coastal Biogeo Information System. That is we have undertaken. This already I told uh, at, uh, ma through our Mandabam field station, we are doing the correlative studies and uh, restoring the correlatives and uh, doing R&D activities. This uh, MSP is a new concept to India. That already we have land-based some uh, rules and regulations. And uh, for example, ICZ term for coastal oriented uh, rules and regulations. But uh, after that, there is a wide area which have cross impact, sectoral impacts also there that is governed by this MSP. MSP is a generic tool and this IOC has given a good definition. It is a public process for analyzing and allocating the spatial and temporal distributions of human activities in marine areas to achieve ecological, economic, and social objectives that have been specified through a political process. For under the bilateral cooperation with the Norwegian country, we have identified two locations in India. One is Lakshadiv and one is Puducherry for implementing the marine spatial planning. Already we have started the work so that uh, initial survey and the stakeholders meeting we have conducted. And uh, we, uh, it is in the process of uh, 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 finalization. Then another important project we have undertaken is uh, preparation of detailed project report for Kalpasar project. It uh, aims to 
build a 30 kilometer dam across the sea connecting the Bhavnagar and Baruch in Gulf of Kambath. The benefits are the meeting per capita demand of Saurashtra region and the irrigation for 10 hectares of land. Reduces, it reduces the distance between Bhavnagar and Surat from 350 kilometer to 50 kilometer. Randal reclamation about 2 lakh hectares. Reduction in groundwater salinity. Then fisheries with uh, direct employment to 1 lakh people. The scope of the project is we have to prepare DPR with other standard approvals and preparing the tender documents for the uh, thing. Gujarat government has approached our ministry and uh, we have undertaken this project and uh, we have already completed the draft agreement. It was submitted to the government of Gujarat for their comments. Already my friends already told about EEZ and other continental self. Uh, already we have covered 91% of EEZ survey has been completed by our ministry. Then remaining will be completed in next 3-4 months. The data are available but any even GSI and other ministries also they can uh, we can share the data with them. And India has submitted the claim for the continental both the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. Discussions are going on for the for getting the Arabian Sea claim. This uh, ambitious uh, program DOM, even though it is uh, it is a multi institutional, multi ministry multi ministerial program, aiming to explore the minerals energy and marine diversity of the underwater world, which was never explored yet. So GSI and other institutions and our ministry are very keen on that. This workshop will help us, uh, definitely will, will be useful and for uh, venturing into the this kind of attitude. Our ministry is the nodal ministry. This will help in India in achieving the target of over rupees 100 million blue economy through the ocean resources. It has six verticals. Even I can say some of our other agencies participate in this is ISRO, NIOT, and Minister of Environment Forest, and other ministries also involved. The next thing is uh, we are undertaking, we are doing updated shoreline change analysis. That is from the remote sensing data, field data, numerical modeling and GIS tools. We are doing national uh, shoreline change atlas. We are preparing. It, it aims to give a timely and accurate information on shoreline change, which will be a base information for any coastal zone management or shoreline management planners and administrators. This is the data we are using, remote sensing data and the methods we are adopted. Quality wise, we are following the normal standards through NNRMS, NSDA and NUIs. Then the accuracy level of the data is 85 to 95 percent. Apart from that, we are doing the Field verification, that is very important. Even though our calculations are 85 to 95 percent, we are regularly uh, doing the field verification. Then uh, classification of shoreline changes, we classified into seven categories, that is high, low, moderate, on low accretion, erosion, and stable coast. This is the statistics of uh, 28 years of data, that is 1992 to 2018. Uh, State-wise, we have uh, Kerala and uh, West Bengal are more eroded coast, more than 50 percent, followed by Tamil Nadu and Kerala, Puducherry. Then, in the western western uh, shore coast, except Kerala, the other states are in stable conditions. 
we are supporting and uh, giving technical assistance to support workers like uh, state governments like uh, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Lakshadweep, Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry in several projects. These are all our technical reports prepared and given to the state governments and other agencies. The Soul Line Change Atlas is uh, put in our website and it is shared with all stakeholders and other state government also. We are updating every year. One of the major case study is uh, beach restoration from Puducherry coast. During 1980s, there was a beach in Puducherry. Then after the construction of uh, harbor 1989, the beach is slowly eroding. They put you it temporarily as a seawall. Come to what collaboration can happen in offshore mining. Go to that slide directly and conclude in two minutes. This kind of studies we have undertaken and we have, and we have keep given. Keep moving, no? Yeah. Keep moving. Keep moving till I say stop. The harbor management. Keep, keep moving. Shoreline management plan. No, what yeah. I'm saying is yes, what we can, what you can do for offshore mining. If you have a slide, you show that. Otherwise, you close the presentation. This is our activities only. Okay. We are preparing shoreline management plan for state government, Puducherry, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala, with the studies of vulnerability, geomorphology, status of the coast, sediment budgeting, and interacting with the stakeholders and uh, finally prepare the management plan for managing the coast and uh, production and the strategies. These are all some of the part of the action plan we have suggested to the gov state governments to protect the coast. Similarly for Andhra Pradesh, we are doing the solid management plan. And for Kerala, we have identified 10 hotspot locations for immediately monitoring and protecting the coast. These locations are uh, given top priority for safeguarding the coast. Thank you. <laughs> sir, I, I have one request, sir. Uh, I, I, I have to uh, share the shoreline atlas map to Secretary MOM in the presence of our advisor, Dr. Vijay Kumar. I have this report. Okay, what we'll do in the end when we do the concluding session, okay. then we'll do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for making our audience uh, aware of uh, what NCCR is doing in coastal zone moving forward. The Oil and Natural Gas Corporation Limited is an Indian, Indian central public sector undertaking Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas Company and is the largest crude oil and natural gas company of India. I request Srimati Srilata Mohopatra, Chief General Manager, to brief the forum about activities of ONGC in offshore. Ma'am, please. Thank you very much. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I am Srilata Mahapatra, uh, CGM Geophysics. I'll be presenting the activities of uh, ONGC in the offshore. Uh, at the beginning, I want to thank uh, um, the organizers for conducting such a workshop, which will foster uh, collaboration and will lead to data integration for augmenting the uh, mineral exploration uh, in India. This is the uh, outline of my presentation. Uh, we have got 26 sedimentary basins covering about 34 lakh square kilometer of area. Out of that, 51% belong to the offshore. So offshore is very important for us. And uh, these are the classifications we use in the um, oil industry domain. Then uh, ONGC being the NOC has the credit of discovering eight out of the nine basins of India. 1974, Mumbai offshore was discovered. 
and the, uh, right now the focus of ONGC is opening of category two basins and e extensive ex exploration in the category three basins. Uh, coming to the offshore activities, I uh, will be the presenting the activities in Western offshore, which consists of Mumbai High, Mumbai uh, Basin, Kausaurastra and Kerala Konkan, and similarly to the Eastern, Eastern offshore. Uh, this is an overview of the Western offshore basin. Uh, we can see that uh, the fast, uh, uh, the total area uh, is uh, amounting to this much of square kilometers. Okay, I'll just. Uh, yes, coming to the resources, uh, prognosticated resources, uh, till now uh, we, uh, uh, only 42% of the resources has been realized and 58% of uh, oil and gas resources yet to find. And uh, 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 we have almost 1182 wells, exploratory wells in this uh, Western offshore basin. And we have got a lot of log data and uh, well data which can help the industry, I don't know, because uh, I'm just presenting the activities. And um, uh, we have uh, produced this much of uh, oil and gas till now, and uh, contingent resources is to of the order of 222, which is yet to be developed because of uh, planning and uh, technology. And uh, coming to the exploration status, uh, as we are working in this field for so many decades, we have. Uh, a large volume of um, uh, 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 volume of seismic data, 2D and 3D, in the shallow and the deep water, and um, of the order of uh, 85,000 SKM of um, 3D data, 3D seismic data. And uh, I want to inform the house that in 2014-15 we uh, um, acquired the state-of-art technology uh, broadband seismic data in the western uh, periphery of Mumbai High, and that gave very good results. And uh, after that, many areas are being covered by the new uh, uh, cutting edge technology. And in 2019, uh, we had conducted uh, fast ever four component 3D OBN, ocean button node technology, in the two fields, uh, in uh, uh, D1, uh, DCS field, and Nilavira field to resolve some of the um, uh, field related problems which gave very good encouraging results. After that, uh, in some of the areas, we are acquiring this uh, four component 3D uh, OBN data. And uh, this is the, about the Mumbai offshore basin. And uh, this is a glance at the stra stratigraphy of the Mumbai offshore basin, which is pro a prolific producer of oil and gas. And coming to this, uh, the acreages we are holding in Mumbai offshore basin, uh, is uh, right now we have uh, 27 um, areas of PML ML blocks. At the same time, under the government's uh, OLP blocks, we have we are holding seven blocks. And um, uh, and la in the la uh, last year, uh, we had three discoveries in the OLP blocks, uh, namely uh, Munga, Amrit, and uh, Mukta, Amrit and. Uh, mm, Moti, Moti, yes. And then coming to Kaushorashtra Basin, the bathymetry varies from 400 meters to 3,000 meters, and the age of the sediments ranges from Mesozoic to recent, with the basement occurring at more than uh, 6,000 meter depth. And uh, about the resources, we find that the 50% um, of the resources lie in the tertiary, and whereas 39% lie in Mesozoic. So Mesozoic uh, is uh, one of our focus area here. And um, the, what are the challenges we face uh, while drilling the well? One is the challenge is that we are drilling uh, through large pile of uh, thickness of trap. And because we are going for uh, messaging exploration, that imaging quality has to in improve. And, um, and in, so in, uh, in the tertiary part, we have normal pressure regime, whereas in the messaging part, we have high pressure, high temperature regime. So that is a uh, uh, challenge we are facing here. And right now we have these blocks, we are working on these blocks. And what is the future? Actually in the eighth round of bidding we had participated and uh, <coughs> uh, in, <coughs> we have uh, got uh, in this uh, one, 
um, in um, we have uh, the, uh, the submitted bid for uh, two uh, areas in cost uh, in uh, Kerala Konkan, which is a category three basin. We want to explore more there. <coughs> Then coming to Eastern Offshore Basin, we have MBA, KG, and Kaveri. Um, uh, uh, the three uh, uh, tectonically different basins, namely Mahanadi, Bengal, Andaman, are collectively operated as MBA basin by ONGC from Kolkata. And um, in Mahanadi basin, actually, this exploration started way back in 2006. But, uh, and the, um, the presence of active petroleum system is already proved, but because of the economic viability, it could not be developed. And uh, these are the areas uh, we are working, uh, pre-NLP and NLP. And um, in shallow water, some of the RIL blocks, uh, they have uh, worked and they have proved the bio biogenic and thermogenic uh, gas presence. And right now, uh, we are holding one uh, area in uh, Mahanadi Basin uh, under OLP. And uh, we have acquired the data. So that, that is actually 19, uh, this uh, 1800 SKM of 3D data we have acquired. That is actually broadband data. And uh, after processing and interpretation, recently uh, ONGC made two, dis uh, two significant discoveries. One is Utkal at the depth of 740 meter, 14 meters water depth and which flowed more than 3 lakh cubic meters for uh, gas. And uh, another discovery is Konak at the uh, water depth of 1,110 meters, which flowed 4.6 uh, uh, lakh cubic meters per day. Uh, <coughs> then uh, this is the actually future acres, uh, who, what we have um, applied to the government. That is almost around 10,000 uh, uh, SKM. And this is the, uh, 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 the challenges uh, for Mahanadi is uh, dealing in the high pressure zone and establishing the thermogenic potential uh, of the gas. Then coming to Andaman Basin, uh, uh, currently, um, uh, actually this basin was discovered way back in 1980. And um, uh, currently, ONGC is uh, having two blocks, one in East Andaman and another is West Andaman. And um, the, the seismic data of 2000 SKM has been acquired and processed, and we are in the process of uh, drilling uh, wells there. This is the reserves uh, Andaman is having, ha having high potential, but it has to be proved and it has to be uh, established. Then coming to KGPG Basin, um, <coughs> we are working uh, at, uh, in, the, in an area of 4,500 4, uh, square kilometer in the offshore areas, and yet to find is for uh, 240 mmt of oil and uh, oil equivalent. And uh, the key uh, focus area is now is the madam, okay, yes, madam, sir. You, you should tell us how your ONGC and uh, the mining department can work together in finding the minerals that we want, and uh, you finding the minerals that you want. I am told that you are going to have this whatever uh, four component 3D technology which you already got or you're going to get sometime in this year. Yes, sir. Which can give quick results on what are the mineral deposits available. So in uh, one meeting, your secretary said that as in when that comes, then we can also get uh, hold of the data. Sir, uh, data sharing uh, that I don't know, but uh, in the Western Offshore we have this. No, data sharing your DGH officer yes, yes, will, yes, present, there, sir. will uh, present in the data sharing session. But you tell us how ONGC can help uh, the offshore mining. No, sir, actually, the, this uh, four component OBN data is uh, in the Western uh, Offshore, actually, D1, Nilam Hira, and uh, even Mumbai High we, have, we are acquiring. So uh, that water depth is uh, almost 80 to 90 meters uh, water depth. So actually it, uh, it is up to the industry how they can use it uh, data. I will just, uh, I don't, because I'm from geophysics background, I cannot uh, speak right now, but uh, we can have discussions with the experts Aapka here. Your presentation is done, you cover kariye, how we can do data sharing. You conclude kariye, madam? Yes, sir, yes, sir. So, sir, uh, this is the... Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, about the KG Basin and in KG Basin and also, sir, we are planning to acquire four component 3D OBN data. 
and uh, cluster 2 and also in cluster 3 which is the uh, ultra deep water uh, gas portfolio and uh, the depth is almost 2800 meters. Uh, for that also we are planning to acquire this four component uh, 3D OBN data. And this is the uh, areas we have submitted for EOI in ninth uh, bid round. And then coming to Kaveri Basin, um, the, the, the first uh, uh, offshore well uh, was drilled in 1981, uh, shallow offshore, and uh, deep offshore was in uh, uh, 1998, but, uh, and the balance of gas and oil is still 81%. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes. So these are the areas where other operators are working. And in uh, Kaveri offshore, we have recently uh, acquired two areas. Uh, and uh, we have acquired the 3D data, uh, 3D broadband data with slant streamer. And uh, there also, uh, this is the details of that. And there also, and this is, uh, there also, sir, uh, we are going to spot the fast well at uh, 1600 uh, meter water depth. So uh, all the well data is there. Uh, and. Uh, uh, actually, we have to discuss how it can be used, log data is there, how, we have to discuss how it will be useful for this mining activities. And uh, this is, these are the areas we have applied for uh, in the UI for the ninth round. Thank you very much, sir. This is all I have to Thank people you, ma'am. People are scared of you. No one is asking you questions. Hello? Because I am yeah. just thinking Madam, about uh, this, you are uh, targeting this uh, uh, sedimentary cover below the uh, basalts, Saurashtra and this Deccan Trap area. So are you also while drilling, touching the basement, while drilling through the sediments? Uh, no, sir. Actually, uh, some wells are there uh, which has gone up to basement, but uh, uh, right now, actually for us, basogic sediments are important. And uh, for us, the, that basement, if you are touching the basement, that drill hole section would be very important. Okay, sir. So okay. we would like that all that. Uh, but very few uh, else will be there. Okay. I'll add to what uh, Actually, in western offshore areas of India, there are two types of basement. One, we call it as a technical basement, what is usually the basalt. Uh, the Mesozoic sediments sub-basalt per se have been drilled in two, three wells. ONGC has already drilled through the entire basalt section and landed into the Mesozoic section. But the actual basement, the, uh, the, the actual basement, what we usually have in the eastern sector, that's the granite gneiss or something, has not been encountered. But in Bombay High, there are yes. evidences of uh, both basalt as a basement and granite gneiss also as a basement. And quartzite also. In Bumbai uh, and Nila Mira, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but there are evidences of Mesozoic sediments below the basalt, and basalt of almost one kilometer has been drilled through. And now the, our area, uh, ONGC's area of exploration, the thrust area is in Mesozoic section, as because huge amount of yet to find oil and gas is remaining in the Mesozoic section. Yes, thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. We have been interacting with Halliburton for okay, the last sir. one year or so. So uh, with their uh, success in uh, targeting this oil and gas, now they are uh, making softwares uh, using AI and L ML applications for interpretation of the data for other mineral deposits. So since ONGC has huge data, seismic data, and you have a very uh, workforce of a trained geophysicist, to interpret that data for uh, oil and gas. So you can also maybe train our uh, GSI geologist or maybe relook uh, at that data for interpretation of uh, this uh, other mineral commodity. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. That can be done. So uh, those could be possible areas of collaboration, GSI, and it, we can facilitate, DGH can facilitate through NGC for our future uh, studies. Yeah. Madam Srilata, I have a question. From backside, we have so many uh, resources and so many uh, um, the stores of these uh, natural gases. And as you told in your presentation, that 58% have not been exploited till date. Yes, yes. We can. 
सो आत्मनिर्भर भारत की बात करते हैं सो माई क्वेश्चन इज दैट वी हैव सो मेनी रिसोर्सेज एंड स्टिल वी आर गोइंग फॉर सो मेनी एग्रीमेंट्स लाइक येस्टरडे ओनली आवर प्राइम मिनिस्टर हैड एन एग्रीमेंट विथ कतर फॉर नेक्स्ट सेवन एट टेन ईयर्स सप्लाई ऑफ नेचुरल गैसेज वाई इट इज सो actually uh, there are so many reasons actually this uh, for example mesogeics actually we have ex like we have discovered there but to exploit that one we need the technology and other uh, and inputs also we need so one in one of the points i have so showing there are uh, gas um, small pockets are there they are scattered to develop that one we need a lot of inputs and uh, that needs a lot of money and that should be commercially viable So, and uh, new technology is coming it will uh, definitely help but we uh, cannot say at this moment that because uh, big st uh, structures are already discovered and small st structures are there and for de to develop that one you need a lot of um, that is cost is intensive and technology intensive thank you madam okay sir thank i have uh, one suggestion on this you know on the activities which ohc is doing and uh, what the plan was showed by gsi in the morning uh, session about the various uh, surveys that they are conducting they are going to conduct in the in this year and the next year so you are holding some of the blocks and you will be doing exploration uh, programs and so if if it is possible for you know gsi to collaborate if they are also acquiring the data or planning to acquire data in your blocks then possibly the two of you can you know go together and acquire a data together so that it meets both the ends which means the the objective of finding oil and gas as well as of minerals no if yeah, that is so possible but so for it possible for you to work yeah, but for us actually we have uh, 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 olp we we have the uh, area for four years so we plan our activities accordingly because we want to study and uh, and we have minimum work program so they, if they can come and fit into that it is okay i think yeah this is something to work out it yes, yes, yes. needs to be so much viable but this is a possible way of collaborating both the organizations yes thank you it is okay. a nice suggestion we will be discussing yes yes it. okay definitely thank you csir nio is the autonomous research institute Uh, in india to undertake scientific research and studies of special oceanographic features of indian ocean region to throw the light on activities of nio in offshore i request pavan devangan sir senior principal scientist to deliver this presentation i request sir to please break crisp uh, crisp thank you sir yeah first of all i want to thank uh, gsi for giving me the opportunity to present the work that nio is doing now the mission of nio is to understand the seas around us and to translate this knowledge to benefit all and some of the projects that we have taken over the years uh, they have uh, uh, good potential for offshore explorations and i will be uh, covering some of those projects here Uh, so uh, the major offshore r&d projects that are going on at present at nio uh, one is the pmn polymetallic nodule survey and exploration uh, we are covering the mid oceanic ridges particularly the karlsberg ridge and we are actively searching for hydrothermal vents uh, which could be a potential mineralization sites uh, uh, we are submitting a proposal on cobalt cast exploration uh, mainly in the Uh, FNNC Nikitin uh, Sea Mount, and then we have been working with the gas hydrate and cold seeps, uh, and uh, in collaboration with GSI as well as with DGH, and uh, then uh, we have got some interesting results from the Andaman Nicobar subduction zone. We have been studying Andaman Nicobar uh, for the past uh, decade, and uh, mainly from the tectonic points of view, but we have seen some significant uh, signatures of fluid migration. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, program, uh, the polymetallic nodule, that uh, actually it was initiated by NIU, 
way back in 80s and it has several components uh, like uh, the survey and exploration part is being done by NIU and then we have uh, EIA environmental and the impact assessment which is also being done by NIU. Uh, we have the sister lab uh, CSIR IMT uh, which is um, uh, looking into the metallurgy part of the polymetallic nodules and the mining technology which is already being presented by uh, Mr. Gopakumar from NIOT uh, who are responsible for developing the mining tools. So as a part of uh, survey and exploration, uh, it's a long project. Uh, uh, in 1981, we were the first one to pick the nodules from Central Indian Basin. And uh, the India was recognized as the pioneer investor. And then uh, we got the exclusive rights from International Seabed Authority for uh, the explorations uh, and we have identified the first generation mine site and uh, we have uh, re-evaluated the estimate of the contract area and the demarcation. So these are the, some of the activities uh, we are doing the spot sampling as well as the grid sampling for some of the uh, resources. Uh, we have been uh, searching for hydrothermal vents. Uh, actually our intention is to study the mid-oceanic ridges and one of the outcome of those things is the hydrothermal vents, uh, which are also very prospective mineralization zones. And uh, we are particularly focused on the Carlsberg Ridge, the other ridges in the Indian Ocean that our uh, uh, MOES organization, NCPR, is uh, carrying out. And this is, uh, this uh, ridges can host the hydrothermal vents, fields, which are associated with massive uh, polymetallic uh, sulfide deposits. And it can also have the abundance of natural hydrogen, which is something uh, as a clean energy we can look at. And uh, then they have primitive uh, microbes. Uh, so in the Carlsberg Ridge, uh, way back in 2002 to 2012, uh, we carried out uh, extensive program, which was supported by both uh, our parent organization, CSIR and MOES. And uh, we have located the signatures of the plume uh, in the Carlsberg Ridge that was identified in uh, the turbidity sensors. So you can see those uh, location where the turbidity is high. Now, <clears throat> these are the plume signatures, uh, but uh, so far we have not located the vent. But, and in the recent years when we repeated the survey, we got the same plume even after a decade. Uh, so these plumes are active and we are sure that there is a uh, significant uh, vent site. And now we are proposed uh, through MOES uh, uh, to do a specialized survey, autonomous underwater vehicle. And with that, uh, we should be able to locate the vents. Then uh, we are submitting a proposal for cobalt crust exploration. There was a talk by the previous authors uh, regarding in the EZ, uh, what we are interested in to look into in the Appenancy Nikitin Seamount, which is in Central Indian. And this is uh, discovered way back in 1959. It is a 400 kilometer long and 150 kilometer width. And this is a major seamount in the central Indian basins, uh, which is a product of late Cretaceous volcanism. And its age was estimated to around 67 million years. And we have also reported uh, this cobalt ridge in which in spin. So this will be taken up uh, in our coming projects. Now, uh, apart from those mineral deposits, we also have significant deposits of gas hydrate and this project was mainly led by uh, DGH uh, and this was a national gas hydrate program and it has two major expedition that covered uh, NGHP expedition 01 which was uh, coordinated by DGH uh, where we confirmed the presence of fracture field hydrate deposits. And uh, since at that time we didn't have the technology to extract the fracture field hydrate deposits, uh, there was a uh, second uh, program that was taken up, an EHP Expedition 2, which was also coordinated by DGH. And there the objective was to discover the gas hydrate in the sand. And uh, NIO continued the research on the gas hydrate, and one of the discoveries that we made was. Uh, in the KG Basin, uh, we found that significant gas is leaking uh, from the seabed. And uh, this was captured by our water column imaging tool. And we can, uh, as you can see in the image here, that uh, once we locate those seeps, if you go and uh, do those uh, graph samples or uh, 
sediment cores, uh, then we can see the hydrate that is sitting on the surface, as well as a lot of chemosynthetic communities. So these are very unique community uh, that are specialized uh, in that location, and they thrive on the chemical energy that they extract from the methane. Now, this was the first uh, cold seep uh, community that we reported from the Indian margins. And uh, we have done extensive survey using the AUV tool uh, that uh, NIOT has uh, developed. So with that tool, we are seeing a lot of extensive uh, gas added deposits sitting on the seabed, as well as the massive uh, carbonate beds. And this is uh, one of the story, uh, like, uh, uh, like where we collaborated and uh, uh, with uh, GSI, and uh, at that time, this was uh, the earlier days of Samudra Ratnakar. They have multi-channel seismic, and we wanted to explore the other regions for gas added deposits. And uh, in this region, in Kaveri Mannar, we ventured, and we collected the seismic data, and we could establish the presence of gas added deposits in Kaveri Mannar in basin. And uh, in one of the later crews, uh, we did uh, uh, sample some of the poke marks. So here we are seeing beautiful chimneys which are transferring gas from the gas deposit to the surface. And we could uh, locate uh, one good poke marks. And that poke mark, once we sampled it, we also found those chemosynthetic communities. These are the tubes, which is also uh, thrives on the methane and the sulfidic environment ecosystem. And then we also found the gas deposits. So uh, our uh, collaboration with GSI continued, uh, and uh, we were working on the Andamans uh, regions. And uh, in the Andamans, uh, we focused on uh, off Nicobar regions, which are showing a lot of seismic activity post that 2004 tsunami Janik earthquake. And this is the one of the Cater Sea Mount that we have been studying in the past, and it is showing a lot of seismic activities. And recently, in 2018, once we visited to map this, we again located those seeps, uh, the gas is coming. And this time the gas uh, we are seeing is not methane, but it's CO2. Uh, but again, once we sampled those gas location, we are seeing evidence of uh, this chemosynthetic community, uh, which is saying that this is also having some uh, methane in it. And this will be the abiotic, abiotic uh, methane, which is uh, derived from the thermogenic backbone. And uh, recently, we have completed one ocean water seismometer experiment uh, to monitor what is happening with this uh, volcanic system. And we got some preliminary indication of hydrothermal mineralization. So this will help us to understand what are the processes that is happening in an active uh, seep environment and how we can develop tools which can help us to explore for these uh, vents. Now, one of the other thing we, uh, yeah. we have uh, doing the work right now with uh, GSI is GSI collect a lot of seismic data in the accretionary prism, and we noticed uh, particularly the fault plane reflections. And these reflections, uh, they show a class three AVO behavior. And in the oil and gas community, is very known that this AVO is uh, indicative of uh, the presence of free gas. So we are seeing some kind of gas migration that is happening in the uh, accretionary prism. Uh, we have identified almost like uh, five to six sites which are very promising and uh, in the near future we have programs where we are going to sample those locations and then try to see what kind of mineralization uh, potential these things has. So this is one application where the seismic data is guiding the mineral exploration. So with this uh, I close uh, the presentation, and this is the view of the barren island from the Andaman Sea.
Thank you, Pawan sir, for sharing uh, the activities of NIO with us. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's break for the lunch. The arrangement of lunch is done in the hall in the first floor. Before that, uh, there is an humble submission to our uh, chief guest. Sir, as we had already run out of time, we, are, uh, we will be squeezing time uh, since we had exceeded. Are we permitted to start the next session by 2.45, sir? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I request everyone to enjoy your lunch and please assemble to the earliest so that we can start our session. Thank you.
for our post lunch session i request to please get assemble in the hall so that we can start our session in time once again warm good afternoon let us have a glance over current mining method for of different commodities practiced internationally for shallow and deep sea occurrences i request dr saju varghese superintending geologist marine and coastal survey division gsi to present a talk on international offshore exploration and exploitation practices thank you uh, angusri respected uh, secretary mom uh, dg gsi uh, other dignitaries and uh, delegates uh, i'll be just uh, briefing about uh, the different uh, offshore exploitation methods or mining methods for the different uh, commodities which is happening uh, throughout the world it is just giving a briefing about uh, different activities only so you know if, uh, if we see the <coughs> offshore mining it can be basically divided into two one is the shallow offshore mining and the other one is the deep uh, offshore mining if you see the shallow offshore mining the basic commodities are uh, the aggregates basically sand and uh, gravel and then placer different types of placer deposits uh, such as uh, rutile deposits or diamond or gold deposits and if you see this uh, aggregate and placer mining this has been uh, throughout the world it has been uh, mined from uh, shallow environment and this mining activities uh, have been uh, you know regulated uh, regionally as well as by uh, different uh, countries uh, they are regulating their own rules and regulations accordingly they are uh, <coughs> mining this uh, uh, aggregates and placer deposits and if you see the offshore mining of uh, deep sea deposits it is still in a very uh, rudimentary stage only because of the different uh, complications associated with the deep sea mining the basic deposits are uh, we have already seen that one like seafloor massive sulfate deposits or polymetallic sulfates we are calling globally and uh, then polymetallic nodules and then cobalt uh, rich uh, crust cfcs and we are calling it polymetallic uh, crystals and uh, this is uh, basically been monitored by the international seabed authority the uh, the exploration as well as mining activities they are regulating and monitoring the uh, uh, or deep sea offshore occurrences as well as uh, mining activities 
and uh, even though uh, they have been regulated by ASA, many Pacific countries, uh, because they have a lot of uh, deep sea de and deposits, so they are uh, regulating, they are formulating and regulating their uh, deep shore occurrences. Uh, they are in, in the venture, and we will be seeing that one. So this is the just glimpse about the different mining activities happening uh, or regulations happening throughout the world. And we have already seen that, you know, the offshore deposits, if you're seeing, uh, basically, they are polymetallic nodules, which is occurring at a very great depth of around 4,000 to 6,000 meter water depth, and having uh, the potential of uh, copper, zinc, and uh, nickel. And then seafloor massive sulfate deposits, uh, they are basically associated with the mid-oceanic mid ridges, uh, other plate tectonic settings, and uh, they have the potential of gold, silver, and uh, copper, and zinc. And then comes the cobalt rich crystals or polymetallic crust, which has the potential of uh, you know, copper, nickel, uh, then uh, cobalt, rare metals such as PGs, and then uh, rare earth elements. You know, the morning uh, NIT, uh, delegation from NIT is um, uh, explaining the complications associated with the deep sea mining because, you know, one is that it is occurring at a very great depth. We don't have the technology. Uh, I mean, or maybe the technology which are in lab scale or in a very uh, initial scale level only uh, for, uh, you know, exploiting. And the, even the exploration is happening. Exploitation activities are still in very rudimentary stage only. Now, these are just a glimpse of the occurrences of uh, the, the different deposits. You know, if you see, uh, most of the, uh, you know, uh, seafloor massive sulfur deposits or polymetallic sulfur deposits are uh, uh, basically occurring all along the, uh, uh, you know, uh, ridge systems uh, in the different ocean, Atlantic and uh, Pacific Ocean setup. And, uh, uh, you know, there is a one mine, we, we, we thought a one mine will be, st will be starting for this uh, 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 seafloor masses report deposit that is Solvara one mine by 2019, but unfortunately, because of the environmental clearance issues and other issues, uh, uh, the company which was exploring and uh, which was, uh, they were exp uh, exploiting this deposit, they stopped 2019, they stopped because of bankruptcy. So, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, it will be taken up uh, soon. And they have they developed their own systems also, different exploitation tools and other mining systems uh, for this uh, mine seafloor mass sulfate deposits, which is occurring at a depth of around five, 500 meter to uh, uh, 700 meter water depth. And uh, another one on commodity is uh, cobalt, uh, uh, you know, uh, rich crust, which is occurring all throughout the seamounts in the different parts of the world. Uh, throughout the world, it is occurring. And then polymetallic nodules are most of the abyssal plain, basically in the Indian Ocean uh, uh, domain, as well as Atlantic and Pacific Ocean also, this is uh, occurring. So this is the uh, overall distribution of uh, different uh, deposits uh, throughout the world. Now. You know, uh, initially, if I told that because the mining has been complicated by the depth, the topography, and uh, other, you know, when we are dealing with the deep ocean deposits, we have to deal with them, a thick column of water, like maybe four to five kilometers of water, and very corrosive environment. So developing such mining system is, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And uh, from 1950s onwards, different countries or a conglomerate of countries or consortiums uh, were working on, have been working on uh, developing different systems. These are, these are uh, the few systems uh, been developed. And, and if you see, the first system was developed by the dry bucket mining system. Uh, it has got a, it is developed basically for the <coughs> polymetallic uh, uh, nodules, which has got a, uh, you know, drag bucket, which, 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 uh, which is continuously dragging along the seabed. Uh, which is connected to a trail rope with the uh, the mother vessel, and uh, uh, but it has been uh, proposed by a French uh, consortium, but uh, because of the cost, effectiveness, and the efficiency, uh, this system is uh, obsolete now. And then a continuous line bucketing mining system uh, uh, developed by Japan. It has initially a single system of uh, mother vessel, but later on then they, they uh, 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 multiple systems were uh, associated and they continuously uh, using a line bucket, they were continuous, they have been continuously mining. And this is also, uh, you know, because of the efficiency and the time consumption and uh, because of the cost effectiveness, they are obsolete. 
And another one is the automatic submarine mining system. Like uh, it is based on a ballast system, which will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, continuously diving down based on the ballast because of the buoyancy, and uh, they will be uh, coming to the uh, bottom of the sea floor. Then it has got a auto propulsion system, which will continue slowly. It will be moving and collecting the. Uh, this all are for basically for nodules being developed because nodules was uh, have been continuously in uh, in in limelight for a very long time. Then uh, uh, recently, uh, in 2002 onwards, uh, uh, America, along with uh, different countries like Japan and other Pacific uh, island countries, they uh, continuously uh, uh, strive for, to develop a system which is a pipeline lifting mining system, which was morning early. Uh, it was been shown by an AOT delegate, and uh, you know, it, this system has basically got a lifting lift pump. Uh, which with an uh, you know uh, flexible pipe and then a seafloor production tool. Uh, this seafloor production tool continuously collecting or stripping off the materials, and uh, they been uh, continuously been through this uh, you know flexible pipe system. It it will be uh, uh, supplied to a intermediate storage and then it will be supplied back to the uh, production uh, support vessel. So for a mining tech, for for mining the offshore deep offshore uh, uh, deposit development of this production support vessel and the C4 production tool. They are very critical because uh, as I already uh, mentioned, like, you know, we are dealing with such a water depth and other uh, complicated areas like, so, you know, the terrain, if you see, this is a very complicated terrain. Uh, the, mo uh, 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 the, the most mineable slope may be two degree but it will be the slope will be varying throughout there. So uh, when you deal with this such a slope variation, so it has to that robotics uh, should adjust uh, automatically with the different variations in the topography setup. So uh, uh, there are <laughs> for developing this uh, seafloor production tools, uh, many countries are still working only and uh, hopefully in the near future we may be having a system to uh, exploit uh, the offshore uh, deposits. So before ex exploration, Exploitation, uh, naturally the exploration should happen for different communities. So these are the, uh, for the seafloor massive sulfate deposits, there's an array of uh, exploration tool, like, you know, uh, along with this uh, uh, supporting vessel, you will may be having acoustics like multi-beam or uh, side scan sonar to get an idea about the topographic variation over here. Then uh, you'll be diving down to the deep environment using a remotely operated vehicle to get a glimpse of for the visual setup of that uh, particular area that you are going to uh, uh, explore. And uh, then uh, once you have the idea, you may be uh, going for a collection of the sample using a, uh, you know, multi-coring system or a grab sampler uh, according to the uh, deposit that you are going to explore. And then you may have a, a, a AUV, automatic uh, uh, under, autonomous underwater vehicle, uh, uh, to which an array of instruments uh, can be attached. So it will be, uh, you know, uh, it will be getting detailed idea because you know all the other regional exploration tool which is uh, atta attached to uh, or, or on board the vessel will get regional uh, setup only, regional uh, variation or regional, uh, you know, topography variation only. But like systems like this AUV. Uh, a different instrument can be attached and it can, uh, you know, keep down to near to the uh, either sea bottom. You'll get a higher resolution uh, details regarding the uh, area. So this is an exploration for the, basically for the seafloor massive sulfate deposit. This is the uh, basic exploration tool uh, the international community is, is using. So coming to the mining of SMS, uh, SMS, there is an SOP being developed by the International Seabed Authority. So this is, you know, extraction of the mineral using the seafloor supporting system, seafloor extraction system. And that slurry will be pumped back to the mother vessel. And uh, once it's come to the, uh, the you know, the onboard vessel or a hopper system, uh, that will be dewatered, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ore will be dewatered, and it may be transferred to the ore from the vessel to a transport barge. Then uh, we'll be back to the, you know, the end, uh, back to the area or to the land for further treatment and uh, processing. So seafloor uh, massive sulfate deposit, uh, you know, Solvara project I was telling. So they have developed systems, and uh, maybe in the near future we can expect a deep sea or mining uh, from the Papua New Guinea area. And uh, uh, this is the different systems developed by. 
um, the Nautilus Minerals, the, min the, the company which was exploring and exploiting this SMS was the Nautilus Minerals. These are the different uh, systems they developed. Uh, the basic systems are this one, axillary cutter and bulk cutter. You know, the ca characteristics of the seafloor massive surface deposits are physical attributes are almost similar to a coal deposit. So, uh, uh, this is the similar systems are on, load, uh, on, on the land, it is available like continuous uh, uh, cutter and all. So, this is being used for cutting and chipping of uh, the material, the seafloor massive surface deposit. You know, seafloor massive surface deposits are uh, very small deposits. So, uh, uh, and uh, they, you know, physical attributes are similar to the coal. When you're cutting and stripping, there is an always a possibility to uh, uh, for the dilution of this ore deposits. So this is being used basically uh, auxiliary cutter, bulk cutter, depending upon the nature of the material. Once the material is available, then a collecting machine, which is will, uh, which will be continuously moving, collecting the the chipped off material, and will be giving off to the the, the uh, you know the sucking uh, pipe and all, and it will be transported off to the uh, mother vessel. So, uh, uh, government of Fiji and Tanka recently has given South Korea's deep sea mining consortium to explore the PMS in their EZ uh, 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 area. And uh, Papua New Guinea, this is the Nautilus minerals. Uh, now it is been stopped because of the environmental issues and all. Now, for the uh, polymetallic nodules, you know, polymetallic nodules are basically uh, uh, found on the seabed or partly immersed in the seabed or completely immersed in the seabed. So they are potato sized or golf uh, bowl sized uh, uh, nodules. So there are different uh, systems for collecting this sort, uh, golf sized nodules being developed. Uh, like, you know, uh, initially there is a mechanical nodule collecting mechanism, which is will continue because it has got a rotary chain tooth collecting head, it will be continuously collecting. But because of the uh, you know, efficiency and all, it is in stop. Then the jet type hydraulic collecting mechanism and or a hydromechanical composite uh, collecting mechanism, they got the uh, similar technology like, you know, you just got a uh, oppositely uh, oriented uh, jet system, uh, which will be washed off the overburdened sediment and collecting the material and pumping up to the, uh, into, into a conveyor and then it will be transported off to the, uh, the pipe, which will be transporting to the mother vessel. And uh, this has been uh, a pump type hydraulic collecting mechanism, NIT developed, India, NIT developed, and it will be uh, sucking the, the material, I mean nodules from the seabed and will be transferred off to the uh, uh, mother vessel. <coughs> so these are the different systems for, mining systems for the uh, deep sea uh, nodules. Now coming to the uh, cobalt rich crusts, uh, it is uh, out of these three commodities, cobalt rich crusts are uh, uh, difficult to explore. One is because it is attached to a substrate uh, system. So when you cut and stripped off, uh, the problem is uh, one thing is that you know was, uh, there is always a possibility to collect the um, substrate also that would dilute the uh, the ore material. Or you may have a chance of leaving that uh, substrate also. That will also uh, you know quality of this ore collecting that will be affected. And another is the topographic complications. Uh, you know th there is a minute variation in the slope all along which. All these substrates have been this uh, on this substrate. This uh, crust has been uh, developed. So, because of this one, this is the most complicated one. So, it is in a still in a in an infant stage only. The development of uh, uh, the systems for the CFCs are very in a still uh, in a uh, initial stages only. <coughs> so, uh, recently uh, there is a uh, uh, a C trial. Uh, for the CFCs ha happened uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, it has been system, this system is Kulong, uh, Kunlong 2000, uh, been developed by the China, China Academy of Sciences. So uh, they have a, a chassis with the hydraulic system and crushing and collecting device, which will be uh, walking along the topographic uh, terrain and will be stripping of the material and collecting. And it has got a collector also on the, uh, this area, this, there is a collector also, that collecting material will be giving uh, to the uh, mother vessel through a supporting system. So this is, uh, so different agencies are working uh, to improve. This is a, uh, uh, you know, we can tell in a lab stage only. It's a very prototyped one. It is not yet for a commercial viability. It has not been uh, given to such systems. So this is one uh, uh, idea of 
collecting uh, the CFC because CFCs are, you know, you see here, the, this is along a mount only the CFCs have been uh, slowly developing. So it just a seabed mining vehicle which will using a, uh, you know, water jet highly high force and we're using high force, the water will be jetted over to the, uh, this system and it will be stripped off and it will be collected. And this is one mechanism being proposed, that's all for the CFCs. So these are for oh, this the different systems are for the deep sea uh, mineral uh, mining. When coming to the uh, you know uh, shallow environment, these activities have been continuously happening for the last uh, you know 50, 60 years. So 1950 onwards, uh, these activities have been happening. So these are the different systems which have been used for the uh, uh, the shallow mining. I mean for the sand and gravel aggregates, if you, precisely if you are speaking. Like you know the, there is a plain section ridges. Uh, which can, you know, unconsolidated material can be like sand, loose sand can be extracted out using these plain section ridges. And then there's a rotary cutter ridges. It is a cutting tool uh, to, you know, to strip off the, uh, you know, more consolidated material. And then uh, it will be sucked into the hopper vessel. And maybe a bucket dredges, for, for, uh, which has been continuing. This is for, dry, uh, you know, for port activities and all other activities have been doing. That can be used for the um, uh, con consolidated and consolidated sand and gravel because so of bucket dredges. So these are the three basic systems uh, that different countries have been uh, using depending upon the type of material. So if you see the sand and gravel mining, uh, basically the sand and gravel mining is uh, happening in in the Europe uh, uh, European countries like you know uh, Denmark France Germany and Netherlands and uh, UK they constitute almost 93 percent of the most uh, the industry of sand and uh, gravel mining out, out of this uh, the Netherlands is the uh, most advanced country for uh, uh, taking out this uh, material and uh, the many Pacific Island countries uh, have also been involved in sand and gravel uh, aggregate mining. So the Secretariat of the Pacific Island Applied Geos Geoscience Commission have been helping in the mining uh, through the regulation and uh, monitoring activities for the sand and gravel ext extraction for the Pacific, Pacific Island uh, countries. <coughs> So these are, few, these are a few examples of sand and uh, gravel mining, you know, uh, the Northeast Atlantic countries. So this is the areas where already uh, the activities are being happening. It's already the mining is uh, been happening along the Northeast Atlantic uh, countries. The Netherlands be the largest uh, producer of this one. So that there are almost 20 million tons of marine aggregates per year UK is, is extracting. This is one of the examples for the sand and gravel uh, mining. And this is another one, uh, the Kiribati, uh, uh, you know, island, uh, because Kiribati island uh, had a problem of, uh, you know, uh, the beach erosion. So uh, <coughs> there is an environmentally safe aggregate uh, project launched and uh, by, uh, for the tar uh, this uh, Tarwa environment, uh, the Tarwa beach uh, environment, and they, uh, 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 they uh, constructed a particular, I mean, a, a, a dredge vessel for M, uh, known as MT, MB Tekimarwa, and the, this is that uh, vessel. So they will be continuously mining of uh, the sand and gravel from the lagoon areas over here. So that means sand and gravel extraction is happening. That's what the point is. And uh, uh, when you're coming to the places, places have been continuously mining, especially from the South African region and from Indonesian belt uh, region also. If you see the examples like in you know, Rutel and Illuminate, basically been mined from Southwest Australia, Southeastern Southwest Australia, Africa, Mozambique, Senegal, Brazil, and all. And then titanium rich uh, magnetite, basically from the Indonesian uh, area. Uh, there are legal as well as illegal mining is happening there. And then tin from Indonesian Sundar uh, belt. And then diamond basically from the South Africa, Namibia, and Northern Australia uh, areas. So this is the basic places being mined throughout the world. So if you see the industrial uh, uh, statistics, you know, aggregates almost uh, 50 to 150 million uh, meter cube per year. Uh, been mined, mining having an uh, you know economy of one to three billion US dollars, and when coming to the diamond places, almost uh, 1.5, 1.1 1 .1 million carats, especially from the uh, African uh, offshore, it have been mined, and uh, then revenue will be around or economy will be around uh, 3.5 billion dollars, and then a quantity of uh, 19,000 tons per year for the uh, tin. 
and having a, an economy of uh, 50 million US uh, dollars. So this is an overall statistics regarding the uh, the the, the uh, shallow mining environment. Now, uh, uh, phosphate mining, if you see, phosphate mining have not been started in throughout the world. Uh, but there are exploration activities have been happened and uh, uh, the, this is the basic mining uh, uh, procedure that we are following like you know a mining vessel deploying using a suction uh, drag head and it will be moving along the seabed and it will the, 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 the material will be collected and it will come to a hopper and uh, the, 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 the waste material like trailings and other waste material will be uh, uh, sent back to the that particular environment value and this ore body will be transferred to the uh, the land environment. Now, uh, uh, regarding the phosphate mining, there is uh, not so exploitation activity so far not uh, started. Uh, the exploration most of the places uh, completed. Yeah. And uh, coming to the carbonate mining, if you see uh, carbonate mining, French continental shelf, uh, it has been happening. And um, uh, it is, but because of the uh, environment issues, uh, it has been stopped. But of Brazilian area of offshore environment, uh, this carbonate mining is uh, still happening. So this all uh, regarding the different offshore activities of deep uh, mining for the shallow and deep sea mining environment. Thank you. Any queries, uh, please? Yes, Dr. sir. Dr. Saju, yes, very, sir. Good, very good presentation. Thank I you, sir. This is not a, this is not a question, then one anxiety. You see, NIOT, NCPR, and GSI, all three great organizations are engaged in SMS, CRC and PMN exploration. Yes, sir. Uh, why can't these three sit together and make a unique exploration plan? Then that will be very useful for we kind of private exploration agencies. Because there is no, there is no unique plan for this. Because everybody is doing area from area to area differ, differs and different countries are following different. So what is your opinion about that? Uh, it's a very good suggestion, sir. Because uh, we as an agency, we have been exploring these uh, different commodities. Naturally, uh, the other, uh, this NIOT has been developed, involved in the different technological advancements. So we are still, we are in a rudimentary stage. We can sit together and we can develop a, you know, uh, a plan. Uh, we come to a, uh, a plan how to this can be extracted uh, from a different, uh, for the different commodities. That's a very good suggestion, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saju, for sharing with us the practices of exploration and exploitation in the global ar arena. To streamline and facilitate private sector participation in offshore exploration activities, I request Shri Pradeep Singh, Director Technical, uh, Ministry of Mines, to discuss on the draft guidelines for notification of private agencies and their participation in offshore exploration. Please, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, see, after the uh, amendment of the MMDR in 2015, when the uh, auction regime started, so we did not have any private sector participation in uh, mineral exploration. I am talking on land mineral exploration. And uh, uh, in 2021, the act was amended and that allowed private sector participation in the mineral exploration. And uh, uh, because of that, uh, the Ministry of Mines then came up with that uh, accreditation scheme. QCI NABET was involved and uh, uh, that scheme was finalized. And today we have 20 private exploration agencies and uh, uh, already notified and 13 agencies are under the process of notification. 
so that ecosystem which was non existent it has developed in a very short span of time and uh, i am very happy to note that yesterday one of the agency that project proponent he uh, called me and he informed me that he has submitted five reports to nmet and he was quite satisfied about that and today i was talking with one of the private exploration uh, agencies representative present here and he he informed that they had made a very significant discovery of one of the strategic minerals and they are just uh, doing the preliminary estimate of the resources and if their resource estimate is right then they will be adding to around 25% to the existing national mineral inventory so uh, this uh, really this uh, private exploration agencies they are uh, contributing to the mineral exploration sector of the country in a big way and now after this uh, uh, now the uh, auction of the strategic minerals has been taken up by the central government and for those 24 strategic minerals then uh, we have allowed these private exploration agencies to directly submit the report to the uh, to directly submit the proposals to the central government through nmet so this is just a brief background so now because of uh, now amendment in oma dr act in 2023 uh, the private exploration agencies because we have got uh, uh, around uh, say, uh, eight uh, that uh, 8000 uh, square kilometer line kilometer of the coastline and uh, 21.5 like uh, 59 lakh square kilometer of the area uh, up to eez and uh, gsi is the only agency which was doing the exploration so we require multiple agencies to also now take up this activity in the marine domain and uh, we are very hopeful that we will start once we start this accreditation and notification then a lot of agencies will come forward and they will carry out exploration and uh, that uh, the o opa which has been based on the studies carried out by gsi which has been estimated that area will uh, 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 increase very fast so now with that idea because we had carry out, carried out that exercise of uh, devising that scheme for private sector because in the ministry we had given this work to in case of uh, uh, online exploration to QCI Nabet for carrying out the due diligence and uh, that scheme was uh, formulated so we have given that scheme to gsi marine division they had prepared one basic structure of the scheme which uh, uh, it is a just a tentative structure which will be uh, the kind of a scheme which we are thinking about for bringing in the marine domain and uh, uh, it is basically uh, the scheme will consist of uh, this uh, some uh, online system of management where uh, this uh, the application has to be filed online and once the application is fi filed online then the the agency which we will engage in the ministry of mines for the process of accreditation they will do some uh, that due diligence uh, and uh, the accreditation process will be completed within as in case of online within a period of three months so we are thinking on those lines uh, the this scheme has not been examined in the ministry of mines it is just a draft uh, so it's a tentative structure which has been developed by gsi and now once it will be submitted in the ministry of mines so it will be uh, examined in detail in the ministry of mines and a lot of consultations will take place and we will take inputs from all the stakeholders before the scheme is finalized so it will have uh, this uh, uh, so several uh, the human resources will be it will have uh, the scheme proponent will have to have some persons which are on on role of the company like project coordinator and technical area expert and then he can uh, involve so many research scholars or uh, the pg students who have just passed out on this uh, from the universities as team members so that the, they get a training uh, on on job training etc and uh, there will be some uh, the for project coordinators some educational and experience uh, this uh, uh, educational qualification criteria 
then experience criteria also. So this is not sacrosanct, actually this is just a tentative draft, so maybe 15 years of overall work experience we will just, uh, after detailed uh, examination, we will decide actually how much uh, years of work experience would be required. And uh, then, then there will be expected functions of the project coordinator. So during the exploration program, he will be uh, in charge, overall responsibility lies with him for uh, executing the uh, exploration program and preparation of the reports, et cetera. And then there will be technical area experts uh, who will be working under the project coordinators. So the technical area, different domains will have different uh, technical area expert. Like we will have technical area experts in the field of geology. Then uh, uh, it, there will be some educational qualification requirement and roles and responsibilities of the technical area expert. And then we will have technical area expert in the field of geophysics. Then, uh, so then uh, in GIS, technical area experts. And then in hydrography, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, this is just the basic structure of the scheme, which has just been, uh, because when we, uh, the secretary, sir, uh, asked us to hold this workshop, so after that only we, thought about maybe uh, preparation of the first draft of the scheme, then the first draft is ready and now it will be examined in the Ministry of Mines. And we will come out with this, uh, finalize this scheme, come out with this scheme. And we are hopeful that uh, just in case like uh, land exploration, this is uh, our scheme has, the ecosystem has matured and uh, it has come out very fast. So similarly, uh, we will, uh, we expect a very good response when this scheme is finalized and uh, multiple players, uh, private players will uh, join hand with the government to take up uh, exploration activities in the marine domain. Thank you so much. If I am an existing uh, private exploration agency, and if I want to diversify into offshore exploration also, mm -hmm. the question I will have is that what extra you know, qualifications or requirements do I have to get notified for offshore mining also? That is the question I will have. Sir, since uh, these uh, uh, offshore area as such doesn't have any players, like in case of the online exploration, there were some uh, experts who had retired from GSI or who had worked elsewhere in the world. So those people, they then roped in two, three more experts and they formed their companies. So in case of marine exploration, actually the, I think the one requirement for the project coordinator will be some experience in the marine field. So basically these retired people from GSI or uh, uh, NCPOR or uh, NIO, etc. So they, they can be hired by the any... No, that is uh, not my question. Yes, my sir. question is, yes, sir. see right now you have 20 exploration agencies. Yes, sir. Some 10, 13 more you are going to add. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the new exploration agencies that you are looking for in offshore... Yes, sir. ...will come from that uh, set of 20, 30 people. Yeah, they can, they can also apply. No, they can also, no. Uh. They are the first movers. Yes, yes, yes. Because they have experience of so, doing exploration, taking money from you. Mm -hmm. They'll be the first people to come to you and apply. Yes, sir. So, when apply, there will be one question in their mind. I am already notified exploration agency mm -hmm. for land. I mm have -hmm. to make an exploration agency for offshore. So, what do I have to do with the existing setup? Sir, like in case of on land when we started, already coal had an accreditation scheme. So, they had already some agencies. Sir, you are not giving answer. Sir, I am answer. I am no, coming to I'll this. I will give you the answer. Yes, sir. The answer is, if I, am an, if I am an on land exploration agency notified by Government of India. Yes, sir. If I get one marine geologist into my team. Hmm. Okay? Hmm. Ye, वो कहाँ हैं वो मुखबद्ध हैं हाँ कब रिटायर हो रहे हो आप इसको रिटायर करके मैं मुखबद्ध हैं को मेरे कंपनी में ले लूँगा यस सर विल आई क्वालिफाई यस सर माय क्वेश्चन इज़ आई एम कमिंग टू दैट ओनली सर 
सर जब कोल वाला जब हमने फिर कोल बोलता है सर हमने जब उसको माय क्वेश्चन इज वेरी सिंपल हाँ आई थिंक वी शुड डू इट करेक्ट यस ओनली पर्सन मिसिंग इन माय टीम टीम इज दी पर्सन विद दी जियोलॉजिस्ट यस सर ओके If I take Mukhopadhyay yes, into yes. my team, yeah. and I show you that look, I have normal geologist, marine geologist, and yeah, so on and so yes, forth, yes. and uh, maybe, uh, but I don't have any experience of hmm. going around and doing hmm. exploration. Hmm. I just have the people who have experience. Hmm. Then I'll apply to you. I should be able to get accreditation. Hmm. So, जो भी आपने draft scheme बनाया, इसको इस तरह से modify करिए कि how to make the existing Exploration agencies to quickly get notified for offshore. Okay. Yeah, apna point yes, of view on it. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, just additional information. I call ka isliye de raha tha, sir. Ki jab jab humne sir apna accreditation scheme banana, to call me jo log the, unko humne bola ki aap sirf apply karoge. So this QCI NABET will not do the due diligence for your case. Only some that additional fees you will submit and you will get accredited. Aha. Yes, sir. We will do that, sir. We will do that. Among that that point is noted, sir. Among all these NPAs, yes, sir. Some of these NPAs are having expertise in marine also. Yes, yes. So we will we will have that kind of criteria that if they employ some uh, retired marine expert, so that process of uh, this uh, the again they will not have to do that uh, examination and the due diligence by QCI. You have such a scheme that all the retired GSA people's rate will increase. Yes, sir. चलिए थैंक यू थैंक यू सर सर अपार्ट फ्रॉम द पर्सन एक्सपीरियंस इन मरीन जियोलॉजी आर वी लुकिंग फॉर द इक्विपमेंट्स ऑल्सो फॉर द नोटिफाइंग एजेंसी इन केस ऑफ ऑनलाइन ऑनलाइन स्कीम द लेबोरेटरी सेटअप विच इज रिक्वायर्ड सो और द सर्वेयर बिकॉज दैट so they can tie up or collaborate with some existing agency so in case of this also we will think about uh, maybe not all kind all instruments uh, being mandatorily but uh, mandatory but they can tie up with the existing agency who already have that kind of setup thank you thank you sir thank you very much Moving forward to the next uh, talk, the successful ex execution of offshore exploration project requires a balanced and integrated approach that address technical, environmental, societal and safety consideration. As the industry involves the ongoing commitment to technology, technological in innovations and sustainable practices will play a crucial role in shaping the future of offshore exploration. I request Sri A.C. Dinesh, Geomarine so uh, Solution Private Limited, to present the offshore exploration strategies. Sir, please. And uh, please, next speakers, please be uh, stick to the timeline. Thank you. Uh, on the industry. Uh, uh, at the outset, I would like to give a big salute to Ministry of Mines and GSI for putting enormous data in the NGDR, which has become the lifeline of we kind of exploration agencies, students and researchers in the country. There is no parallel in the country for that. No agency could put this much data in the public domain. Earlier, that was a dream by many of us, but that, uh, that dream has come to a reality now. So any data, including the marine, it is available. Now so, we, need to, we need to upgrade the dream now. Yes, sir. We need to get people like DGH, yes, here is the people like DGH and Atomic Energy and others, MOES, who have enormous data yes. uh, to also to add to the NGDR portal. So we have already done uh, a few meetings and a lot of data is coming in. We will now further populate that NGDR and take it to the next level. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So I will, I will very quickly, I will go through this, these slides. Actually, this is a synoptic view of uh, what is available in the Indian offshore. I was also part of this uh, exercise when I was in GSI. So these, these colors are uh, very distinct. 
phosphorite, lime mud, polymetallic sulfides, which is in which form and resource format. Only we have got now four commodities, that is uh, uh, FEM and Krebs and Nodils. We, we, I don't call it as a CRC because the cobalt uh, content is not up to the grade of CRC. Then uh, lime mud, sand, and heavy mineral places. So we, this presentation we have, we have, we have crafted to, to, uh, to help and to encourage the, uh, the successful bidders for these blocks. Everything we have designed like that. Now you can see for the four commodities, one, two, three, four, the, the first three commodities are falling within zero to 120 meter water depth. And that, is a, that has got a very unique uh, strategy of exploration. And this deep water, more than 600 meters water depth, we are getting in Andaman, more than 600 meters FEM and Kassan nodules. In uh, Lakshadweep, we are getting around 1,500 meters. So this is a work scope for the entire uh, gamut of exploration activities, sand, heavy mineral, and uh, lime mud. Uh, I'm not uh, going to the details of that one. Boat mounted, uh, the geophysical and geological explorations, oceanographic, and environment. Environment is an integral part of these activities. Then FEM and Kassan nodules, you, you have heard many presentations about that one from GSI, NCP, or NIOT. And uh, we have, that's why I asked a specific question. Why, if you make a, a very uniform exploration policy strategy, we can follow that. So this, very interesting, indicated and possible mineral occurrence within the Indian offshore. These, these are some conceptualized models and some, with some indications. We, we can expect a sand deposit in the Paleo River channels, very high grade construction sands, which is not reworked. Heavy mineral placer deposits of older cycles of deposition. I, I can, you may be surprised when a 20 meter core was drilled for a um, government agency in the, in the uh, Chavara offshore. They got from 13 meter onwards, they got more than 50 to 85 percentage heavy mineral places. You imagine, these are this, the older cycles of heavy mineral deposition. So you, now we are mining for construction sand. Certainly we anticipated, we envisaged in the past, below six meters or eight meters, you may get a hand enrichment of heavy mineral places. Not everywhere, but you have to look for that. Then diamond occurrences in the Paleo River channels, you see most of the diamonds of India, Hope, uh, uh, then Kohinoor, all are from up, up, upstream of Vijayawada. Downstream of Vijayawada and Pannar, uh, very detailed explorations are not done properly. Now we are, we are making a proposal for, for an MET to explore that one. Same way, in the offshore we expect, not like as equal as Namibia, Namibia is supplying most of the diamond in the world, so not like that, but even then we can expect some uh, diamonds in the offshore region. We have remarked some 7,000 square kilometer area between Krishna and Pannar River. So this is a unique one. You see, Sharif et al. 2013, they have brought out the Bharatapura Paleo River channels by very close-paced, uh, Sharif is here, very close-paced seismic survey. And uh, what we did in, in GSI as, as uh, resource estimated, you see, you can see that arrow mark, this exactly that place. That place is a Paleo River mouth of Bharatapura. It is a buried history. There we are getting around 597 million tons of sand. So all these river channels, whether in East Coast or West Coast, can be explored, brought out this Paleo River channel for high-grade uh, construction sand. And this is an indicated possible mineral resources, hydrothermal sulfides in deep water. We, we, we have got some Andaman backup spreading center around 70 or 80 kilometers active zone and uh, inactive zone also there. But NIO has reported, PS Rao 1996 reported, uh, some pieces of chimney, and 2006 and 7 GSI reported chunks of pyrite crystals from the same area, ABSE. So there are chances because the water depth is 300 plus, 3000 plus. Then phosphatic sediments, you know that all along the west coast, seamounts and ridges are having phosphatic the indications. Dr. Anil Kumar has recently published paper on that one. And uh, Lakshadweep Sea also, we expect some, some, in, some phosphatic sediments, uh, repositories within the, that uh, wave cut terraces, then uh, step falls, etc. Metalliferous mud, and there are some indications we got in uh, uh, some cruises earlier, that is around Lakshadweep and between uh, 90 East Ridge and AAP, Andaman Krishna Prism, and ABSE, we can expect uh, metalliferous mud. And we have made some unique model for that one. Unique means for our understanding. 
now now uh, being a private exploration agency we are ready to mobilize vessels we are ready to mobilize auvs and any instrument from india and abroad and we are having tie up and we are uh, we are <coughs> equally charged up and uh, we are equipped also for taking up all the marine challenges to come these are the, this we can we can mobilize this conspar uh, which not is having now then uh, one case study i will present here before my conclusion uh, actually we have done a, when a study in the offshore of qatar qatar offshore abu samra uh, a, a marine sand exploration a very detailed marine, marine sand exploration here for uh, qatar primary mater material company so this this is a block around 31.5 square kilometer area then uh, we made uh, this is a workflow geophysical and geological surveys single beam bathymetry sub bottom side scan surveys and uh, drilling up to 20 meter below the sea floor then uh, all we, we got this this uh, we have to comply with the uh, british standard of U european nations and qcs qatar construction standards that that we have to comply with and uh, oceanography and environment for benthic life and water tide and currents these are the some of the this one plan then uh, these are the test we have carried out this we can be this can be applied in india also for for marine sand because this will tell you what is the quality of real sand whether it is for construction or plastering or any other purpose beach nourishment everything we, this will tell you then these are the block models for the dredging plan we made in sarpak then this is the outcome we have we have brought out about 698 million metric tons of sand and in that one qcs complying 498 and bs bs british standard complying 661 and the environment impact and these are some the, we identified under underwater photography then the sea grass oyster beds and microalgae and now coming to this one for potential investors and mining company geomarine can support in full life cycle from bidding to production these are our cap capabilities and these are our current projects now running projects for spa caps ministry of mines and iot zaraf international dubai and uh, spa caps and uh, oman doha and uh, ministry of mines thank you so much any question any query well, i have a question on uh, on the notification on uh, uh, notifying private exploration agencies for uh, offshore uh, do you think that uh, we'll have problem finding uh, lot of companies for example i see that your company will probably qualify on day one so, right yes. because you already have experience you've done some work so you think we'll be able to find uh, enough companies to be notified as private exploration agencies for offshore areas sir certainly there there if there is a chances possibility certainly people will come to uh, and comply with uh, this whatever conditions are there no people are available expertise is available and the instruments are available in the market and in e no need of uh, owning it we can hire so certainly companies can come up as you said uh, now the pas 16 20 pas already experienced so only they have to do some add ons so they can take certainly take up the challenges so pradeep we can do a separate uh, session or a 2 3 hour session with all the private exploration agencies once your scheme is ready then we can show that scheme to them take some inputs and then encourage them to get notified or get qualified under the offshore area also okay ji thank you thank you sir thank you so much thank you dinesh sir IRL India Limited is an Indian public sector undertaking and operates in the field of mining and processing of rare earth element now i uh, i would like to call shri sundar si chief manager from IRL to present on modern techniques and processing methodologies welcome sir
respected secretary, Ministry of Mines, senior dignitaries of various departments, officials. Uh, I am here to present uh, uh, about our uh, separation techniques, methods we use in our IRL. Uh, first, I would like to share about IRL. We are a mini Natanas category one company under atomic control of Department of Atomic Energy with the mandate of producing rare earths and other strategic compounds for national security. For ensuring raw material security and its strategic operation and to cater the feedstock requirement of large number of industries in the country, including MSMEs and state PSUs, we are engaged in harnessing of atomic minerals, which are commonly known as beach sand minerals from the coastal deposits. Uh, IRL establishments are in our, our corporate offices in Mumbai and uh, we have mining and mineral processing units at uh, Chavara Kollam, Manamala Kurchi MK and uh, Orissa Sand Complex, Oscom Chatrapur. And we also have Rarath, uh, Rarath Permanent Magnet Plant at Vizag, Rarath Division Alva, and we are all also having Rarath Extraction Plant at Orissa also. And we have Rarath and theme park, uh, Titanium Theme Park at Bhopal. Basically, we do mining, mining and mineral separation. By mining, the method now we are using is uh, beach washing collection, that is in the intertidal zone, and dredge mining in the inland deposits. So dredge mining in, in, in beach washing collection, we just uh, manually we use to collect the material and we'll transport, uh, we'll, uh, we'll st stack it separately and uh, we transport to the plant. And for dredge mining, we are having a floating dredge uh, with an uh, inbuilt uh, uh, concentrator plan where we will be simultaneously refilling the back uh, of the refilling the mine out area. The, the, the heavy minerals, uh, these are the heavy minerals that already that has been specified and they are basically uh, separated by by their physical properties, uh, specific gravity, electrical conductivity and magnetic property. And uh, these are the, uh, the, the, the minerals that eliminate rutile zircon, silmite, monocyte, garnet, ducoxin and uh, they are Physical properties has been displayed here. Some are conducting, some are non-conducting, some are magnetic, non-magnetic, paramagnetic. Based on that, our, we use uh, to separate the minerals individually. And this is generally, a, uh, uh, this is the flow chart that, that we are using at our plant for separating the minerals. Basically from the raw sand from our, all the mining sites will be upgraded and uh, uh, wet high intensity magnetic separator will be used for separating it as magnetic and non-magnetic Davies. So no, from non-magnetic, again, that will be dried. Uh, it will be uh, high tension separators are used for conducting and non-conducting. And s similarly, for non-magnetic circuit also, we use to high tension separators, magnetic separators, uh, wet, uh, wet tables and column flotations, etc. Uh, these are the gravity separators. Uh, spirals, use spirals. Uh, we use two, uh, two types of spirals, the high grade spirals and medium grade spirals. High grade spirals generally for concentrate, uh, uh, for high, high heavy minerals we use that. For tailings only we use MG, uh, medium grade, medium grade. And now earlier we used to have HG8, but now we are, nowadays we are using HG10. And uh, medium grade also earlier it was four, now it is seven, like that. Hydrosizers, it is uh, that we use for removing of the slimes. Our uh, mining, from the mining sites we get more slimes. So for removal of slimes we use that hydrosize. So that will be used prior to the spiral spiral unit and uh, low magnetic intensity this is uh, this uh, this has a magnetic intensity of 700, 700 gauss where uh, the unwanted ferromagnetic materials will be removed prior to the spiral unit uh, this is low magnetic uh, low intensity magnetic separator and uh, we have wet intensity high intensity magnetic separators so this uh, we, uh, this is mainly for this is a, a magnetic int intensity of over 11,000 gauss. So this is a, based on this we will be removing ma magnetic from the raw sand. Uh, mainly that consists of aluminite and monocyte that we remove with the help of WIMS. Another this is the high tension separators we use. This is the con this is the conventional earlier we used to use this uh, uh, single electrode high tension separators and uh, plate separators combinedly we were using. Now, uh, because uh, this is only a single electrode, and now we are using three electrodes, corona stat separators, where uh, uh, the maximum conducting we can uh, uh, we can collect more because of three uh, because of the presence of three electrodes, and each electrode passes the conductivity the material has been collected that can be collected. Uh, 
and the uh, and the efficiency of that uh, that conduct that uh, corona stat uh, the, uh, with the we can see that uh, with the help of three electrodes uh, this is based on this is a uh, actually it's a uh, by processing a non conductivity zircon zircon is a non conducting material where in the three electrodes we can uh, recover zircon up to 82% whereas in single electrode we can the zircon recovery recovery is only 35% Uh, this is the conventional magnetic separator. The, the, this is induced roll magnetic separator, where the magnetic magnetic field is induced into the roll, and from there that is used for separating magnetics and non-magnetics uh, uh, minerals. And now we are using this uh, rare earth drum magnetic separators and rare earth magnetic roll separators. Uh, <coughs> Uh, that magnetic field in rare earth drum magnetic separators is high because of that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, this efficiency is very high and the more magnetic materials are uh, without uh, can be collected in this. This is the latest now we are using rare earth drum magnetic separator and uh, rare earth roll magnetic separators. This roll magnetic separator also is uh, based on the thickness of that uh, belt that can that uh, our intensity varies. This is the operation comparison between these uh, old, com old uh, conventional uh, this one uh, magnetic separators and uh, RDMS and RERMS. Now RDMS only because of the uh, uh, energy efficiency, the operation cost is very less. It's only 17 percent. And we use wet tables. Uh, this is mainly for uh, separating the non-conducting uh, non and non-magnetic materials of like zircon and silimonite. So wet tables that concentrate will be collected as uh, zircon you and the middling, sir. Come to the offshore mining part. S sir, what offshore. you are doing in beach sand mining is a different thing. Sir, that is offshore. You see, the, there, are, there are certain areas and certain mines sir. which are reserved for IREL. Reserved for DAE. Sir. Okay. So we have already handed over some 16 reports Sir. to IREL. And whatever is to be done within the territorial waters region, even if it is normal sand also, only IREL, IREL can, can do. do. Yes, you so you tell us what is your preparation? Sir, what sir, coordination, sir. what help, what support you need from Ministry sir, of Mines definitely, sir, actually in the way forward? Okay, sir, definitely. You uh, go to the slide where it is written way forward. No, sir, that we have not uh, prepared. No, sir. you go to the last slide. No, sir, that is thank you only. So go to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sir, okay. actually, yes, sir, now actually, imagine that sir, this is the way forward. You tell us sir. what is the way forward sir, definitely this for sir. working between IREL and Ministry of Mines sir. in taking up uh, new blocks. See, if we... Once we start offshore mining in this country, probably IREL will have 50 percent of the mines, sir. you know, yes, sir. because those mines we can't give to any private fellow. Yes, sir. So please tell us. Yes, sir. In fact, when I told your secretary yesterday in Bombay, he was very enthusiastic. I told him that we can even reserve one or two non-heavy mineral mines. Suppose you want to make money in lime mud. We'll give you the lime mud block also to you. Okay? Okay, sir. So, this is the time for IREL sure, to strengthen its uh, manpower, sure. to strengthen it is, its, its machinery, sir. and uh, develop systems to take up more and more offshore mining. Sure, sir. So, th definitely, sir, this, uh, this workshop, uh, uh, after attending this workshop, uh, we got an idea about the, that uh, uh, in the shallow depths uh, uh, presented by NAOT that... Uh, uh, and uh, GSI, what the practice that they are doing for for what what are the uh, for exploitation of uh, minerals in the offshore? What are the practices followed? So that uh, that will be helping uh, helping us, and we will study about that, sir. And uh, we will uh, we will implement. Sir. We will implement. This sir. is a good idea. Uh, yes, sir. You and NIOT sir. start some joint project sir. for developing some technology for doing, let's say mining in territorial waters or mining of heavy minerals or whatever, yes, yes, sir. you start working with them from now onwards. See, yes, when we do auction, it will take one or two years to get approvals. By the time, you should have the technology. Sure, sir. That will do. Okay? Sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Moving forward for the next session.
Effective data sharing and collaboration require a combination of technological, organizational, and governance measure. It's essential to balance the need of data accessibility with protective of uh, with protection and sensitive information and compliance with legal and ethical standard. Clear and transparent communication is key to the building trust among collaboration, collaborating agencies and ensuring the success of shared initiatives. Our next uh, point is modalities of data sharing between user agencies. I will be uh, calling out uh, the uh, name of the uh, organizations. They may please come forward and share their views on their database. First of all, I will call the representative from Director General of Hydrocarbons. Thank you, ma'am. Very good afternoon to all. Uh, respected Secretary, Sir, uh, DG GSI, other dignitaries on the dais, uh, of the dais, and uh, head of the institutes, research organizations, scientific bodies, and uh, PSUs, I see. Uh, it's uh, really a uh, Absolute delight to be amidst you all today. And my compliments to uh, Secretary Sir and uh, GSI for organizing uh, such a workshop. Uh, yes, it is the need of the hour that we harness the maximum potential, the mineral potential, the oil and gas potential of our country to its maximum. Uh, so having said so, uh, I'll just uh, give a brief outline that what DGH does. DGH is basically the Directorate General of Hydrocarbons under Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Uh, you all know that uh, uh, since independence, 1947, and the oil and gas in our country was mainly uh, controlled by the national oil companies, that is ONGC and Oil India Limited. And uh, out of that, ONGC was born in 1956, and till 1993, till 1993, uh, 1991, the government opened the liberalization, the econo economic liberalization in the country was opened. And since after that, there was a level playing field wherein all the national oil companies were equated to any private company which are involved in oil and gas. So to regulate that, uh, Directorate General of Hydrocarbons was set up as a regulator and also to facilitate the oil and gas exploration in our country. Uh, you all know that India is an energy deficient country and currently India imports around 87% of its crude oil. Our total oil and gas uh, production is around 30 MMT and we import around 220 MMT. So a need was felt to boost and accelerate the oil and gas exploration. But uh, during the process of oil and gas exploration from 1950s onwards, huge amount of data these oil companies have generated. Why I am saying so is because the oil and gas companies, prior to the actual drilling of the well, the geological survey, the geophysical survey, the well, while the well is being drilled, a lot of petrophysical parameters are calculated, are developed, so the well logs also are taken. So all these data over the years has been housed in a national data repository in 2016, which government set up uh, at DGH. So uh, I will not take much time into uh, those background uh, notes. So uh, as I just mentioned, this is the role of DGH. DGH collects and stores all the ENP data related to oil and gas exploration in our country. So uh, this has already been, uh, many times it has been told, if you see the total sedimentary basins, we have 26 sedimentary basins, and uh, 
Uh, there are three categories, 3.36 million square kilometer. 50% is on land and 50% of offshore. Uh, shallow water, uh, we say uh, less than 400 meter bathymetry and deep water 400 to 1500 meters of bathymetry. This, uh, this categorization is as per the uh, global oil and gas industry practice. And ultra deep water is 1500 meters. Uh, currently, India has around, uh, uh, around 25 billion tons of oil equivalent and out of which only 12.4, 12.1 billion tons has been established. And there is a huge yet to find potential, which uh, I'm sure with everyone coming together, we'll be able to do that. Uh, currently, this, this map shows the total acreage of all the ENP operators in our country. So uh, right now, sir, we have around nine offshore basins with an undiscovered resource of around 7.6 billion tons and 6.9 billion tons is the discovered resource. We have 51 offshore blocks in the country, both in the West Coast and East Coast. This I am saying for all the ENP operators, not only the NOCs like ONGC, and, but whether it is BP, Reliance, and other uh, private operators also. So uh, one thing I must highlight here is why the offshore exploration uh, during the course of today's presentation, Madam Mahapatra mentioned that one thing that in India, the Bombay High Discovery was made in 1974, and that field is still, it's a giant field, it's still producing. But on and around, if you see Bombay High Ke Aspas, many areas up to the economy, exclusive economic zone, that is up to 200 nautical miles, was not available for ENP exploration in the country till 2022. And a lot of uh, governmental, uh, government efforts have gone into that. And Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas with Ministry of Defense, Ministry of uh, D DAE, Ministry, uh, Department of Space. Very recently in 2022, I must share with you that 99% of the total no-go zones of our country have been freed. And the entire this pink area, which was hitherto unavailable for exploration, is now free is now available for oil and gas exploration. So when I, when I say oil and gas exploration, they are now, since 2016, being operated by hydrocarbon exploration licensing policy. Earlier it was new exploration licensing policy, and now it is hydrocarbon exploration licensing policy. That means any operator has got the freedom to carve out any particular block the entire country has been divided into grids. One grid is one minute by one minute, 10 minutes by 10 minutes, and in some areas it is one minute by one minute. So one minute by one minute grid is roughly around 3.36 uh, square kilometer, and uh, around uh, 330 uh, square kilometer is uh, 10 by 10. So now you see towards the right, the entire area is now available for oil and gas exploration. So any, any operator, who can submit an expression of interest for oil and gas exploration, not limited to oil and gas exploration. I again repeat, not oil and only related to oil and gas exploration. If there is any unconventional source of energy like coal bed methane or whether it is for shale gas, the operator is free to do that. So uh, these are some of the, uh, you know, the completed projects, the mega projects which uh, DGH has done uh, on behalf of government of India. One is the National Seismic Program, that definitely is uh, pertaining to all the online part. But in Andaman area, you see that in Andaman area, the entire, on the east and the west coast of Andaman Islands, up to the exclusive economic zone, the data has been acquired under EEZ survey. Uh, this is uh, a, a cartoon to show that uh, the, the area, uh, the Andaman, the white area towards the west, has already been acquired. That was done uh, two years back. Up to the exclusive economic zone towards the west, the data is available. And towards the east coast also, this data has been acquired. Sir, to tell you that this data is currently under processing. And by May 2024, the entire data will be available. The interpretation will be done. The entire this data will be available. So this is a huge opportunity for all, all operators, whether it is in the mineral field or whether they are in the oil and gas exploration, 
to have, they will have access to this data. And this is a huge amount of data, 80,000 line kilometer of data, both in East and West Coast has been acquired, which is currently being processed. Besides this, sir, uh, there are certain upcoming projects. DGH has also undertaken a project uh, beyond the ex uh, extended continental shelf to, sub, uh, to support our documents, to submit our claim under the UN clause. And that approval also, uh, sir, has been obtained by Ministry of Expenditure. Probably it is around 800 crore project, uh, 410. 410 crore project, sir, and uh, the concurrence has been obtained from Ministry of Expenditure. And uh, very recently, 20 days back, sir, uh, that, has, uh, that has come. So uh, the acquisition will start from May, John, uh, May to June, sir. So this will be, uh, we will be interacting with the NIO and NCPOR also, and Dr. Ms. Kurian also is aware, and uh, Mr. Dr. Vijay Kumar is also uh, from Ministry of Earth Sciences. So uh, that also during the next and the two years, this data also will be acquired. Uh, sir, this national data repository uh, was set up in 2017, and the key functions of NDR uh, is uh, that online 24 by 7 access of all ENP data of all the sedimentary basins. And we also organize physical data room with high-end workstation and GNG software for basin block level assessment and oil and gas potential. So people from NIO, people from GSI have are coming to a National Data Repository for data viewing, for data, uh, uh, and we have also exchanged a lot of data with uh, other scientific institutions also. And uh, to, just to tell you, sir, we have around seven to eight petabyte, seven to eight petabyte of data at, uh, uh, for, uh, at DGH. And uh, uh, we have to work out the modalities, as you mentioned, sir, okay, how to populate this huge amount of data into the, uh, you know, sir, your port, that uh, national geoscience data. Uh, for that, sir, we would be requiring separate discussions and deliberations because we have to increase the storage capacity. And storage capacity, uh, we had a meeting at GSI uh, Kolkata office with your geophysics division also, but this data, we, this aspect, we will look into it. Uh, so these are some of the objectives and functions. Anyone can just register into the national data repository and uh, have a view at the India, what is the uh, data available. So the key aspects of NDR is uh, uh, easy ac ease of access, this is GIS enabled web portal. And we also uh, almost uh, from OALP, that's Open Acreage Licensing Policy, we just concluded round eight on 3rd January and around 2,30,000 square kilometer is available for uh, exploration and 134 blocks. And discovered small fields, DSF-2, some 24 contracts, and DSF-3, uh, 30 contracts. So what I want to submit here is we have a lot of data. We have a lot of uh, uh, the well logs. We have also the seismic uh, signatures for all these. During the, process, during the course of developing this data, we can also look for, like we have the uh, geothermal data, we have the subsurface temperature data, whether they can be used for harnessing the geothermal energy or not. So these things are available at DGH, we, we have the data. I would request and urge all the all uh, re related or interested uh, agencies to come and just view the data. And whenever you ask for some data, we will be ready and very happy to provide you the data. Uh, these are some of the salient points of data sharing, uh, visualizing and sharing of data with ENP and non-ENP users, sharing of data with recognized Indian foreign universities and academia, sharing of data with government institutions. Broadly, these are three subcategories under which the data is being provided uh, with non-ENP operators, with Indian foreign academia, uh, Indian foreign universities and academia, and with government institutions. Uh, so that's all, uh, sir. Uh, so DGH, uh, DGH has uh, got the, uh, the data, uh, the seismic data, the well completion report data. We have all the logs of the wells which have been drilled. Around more than 25,000 uh, wells have been drilled so far. So uh, all these are available at National Data Repository and DGH would be happy, more than happy to facilitate any process which it feels to uh, harness the total, uh, the, the offshore uh, domain, the offshore potential of our country. Thank you, sir.
designed to uh, look for features which are deep seated. Correct. So with the same data, do we require a reprocessing? Of course, GSI may be interested in the features which are on like uh, shallow, very shallow, shallow or 100 meters yes. top. So yes. can the same data no. can be used or does it require reprocessing? Yeah. Sunil, can you respond to what he is telling? Take the mic. Huh? Yes, same data can be used, but it needs to be re reprocessed with an objective of cell overrun. So how complicated is the processing? Is it, like it is not a, it is not a complicated process. You have to start with the raw data, and then uh, the processing steps are there where you can concentrate uh, on the section wise. Wherever you want to concentrate, a similar process can be applied. For, but needs to be definitely needs to be reprocessed for your mineral exploration and uh, other objective, because these are all data with the deeper objective has been acquired. But the data is good enough for the. Yes, sir. data is good enough. Uh, Sometimes you will have some missing offset because of the obstruction, but offshore you don't have that problem even. Um, actually, uh, one thing I want to add. Uh, actually, uh, suppose you are going for offshore, um, normally conventional data, what we have, uh, the near offset is uh, say 100 meters, 120 meters, something like that. So very shallow objective if you have for mineral exploration, that may not uh, be sufficient. Yeah, we have normal here, not top 100 meters. No, that way you will not, uh, yeah, that will not uh, solve your purpose. If it is a little deeper, then it is okay because near offset is almost 100 meters. So, uh, like whatever new uh, processing you do, that part will not be there. But uh, uh, say some new technology is coming, like uh, swim, something like that. So, shallow part they can reconstruct it. Reconstruct, shallow illumination can be done through their software that is there. Uh, but um, near offset, yeah, that will be. which has got very high resolution, 15 centimeter resolution is there. So just I'm asking whether the seismic also can serve the same purpose. The way we uh, get the information from the sub-bottom profiler, that's what I'm No, it won't so work. We can have the let discussions. Me, let me say a word on this. First thing is these data were not acquired for the purpose of no mineral exploration. So yeah. the focus was oil and gas, which is typically no more than a kilometer or so, between two to three kilometers. But uh, no, it may just happen that these data may be of use to you, but you'll have to check and, and if there is a possibility of reprocessing in which you are able to ge get some few hundred meters of top no, uh, layer depth, then that will be uh, a good thing. But uh, we cannot say of the, you know, no, just do, on a generalized to do, this, to do this check that you are suggesting, yeah. what we can do is to take up a few pilot projects. Yes. Mm. To take up a few examples, both onshore and offshore. Yes. Onshore also you do a lot of uh, drilling, yes. looking for uh, petroleum and natural gas and that same area where in Jharkhand or Andhra where you are drilling, we may be also interested in finding uh, lithium or some critical minerals. Yes. So therefore, we can, we can shortlist a few areas of our interest yes. where you may have done uh, drilling onshore. And also shortlist a few areas of our interest where you have done offshore and uh, do this, uh, whatever this uh, gentleman has suggested about reprocessing that data. Yes. Right? And see whether it is working out or not. Yes, I think that, that should really be the approach right now. Uh, what we can do is we can facilitate you know, the people from GSI who can visit our center, uh, have a look so at I our data. I want to know from GSI... Who can lead these two, three pilot projects? Uh, uh, one more point I want no, to say. No, one second. Let me complete yeah. this. Can, can we, no, wo to offshore wala hai. No, can Saha, what you do is that you coordinate between these offshore and onshore people and shortlist three, four projects, maybe two on this side, two on that side, where we can we can see what we can get out of the DGH data and whether we can derive some of some inferences regarding uh, our minerals using their data. Is 
there is already a project a project which is under the mou ने जब वो सजेस्ट कर रहे थे तब आप नहीं बोले ये है ना तब आप सो रहे थे है ना मैं ये कह रहा हूँ ये जो पायलट प्रोजेक्ट यदि एक ऑलरेडी चालू हो गया तो एक और चालू करिए और ये ऑफशोर में एक एरिया लीजिए ये तीन पायलट्स को शुरू करिए और एक महीने में इसका रिजल्ट बताइए डीजी साहब वॉट आर यू सेंग Yeah, the other thing I was saying that uh, as the, uh, you were saying about reprocessing the data, uh, we, uh, uh, this also you have to ensure that when you are doing for shallow seismic reprocessing, you know, that is a different from the normal processing that we do for oil and gas. So you'll have to pull in the right experts who can do this shallow seismic processing with the existing data. That requires some skill set. So this is something you have to be aware of. That's all. So that's about the skill set and how you can do it, achieve your objective. Thank you. Above 30 meters. Okay. Ultra shallow is up to 25 to 30 meters. Yes. After May, sir, the entire up to EEZ data will be available for interpretation, sir. And the processing and interpretation will be over. So that will be a huge boost to the... All the agencies can make the most of it, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now I request the representative from Geological Survey of India to speak on National Geoscience Data Repository. Respected Secretary, Ministry of Mines, Government of India, Director General, Geological Survey of India, all the dignitaries present to be here from different agencies. Very good afternoon. I am Dr. P. K. Singh, Deputy Director General in Geological Survey of India. I'd, I would be explaining about the uh, national uh, portal developed by Ministry of Mines, Government of India, uh, which is National Geoscience Data Repository. There is no need to say that for any sort of uh, geological exploration, a robust and authentic baseline geoscience data is required. And this collection of such type of data is very time consuming, energy consuming, a lot of expertise involved. Uh, and Geological Survey of India has a, a, a very vast database, geodatabase, which can be used by different agencies and which has been being used mostly by Geological Survey of India for such type of expression. But uh, with the uh, change in the government policies uh, and data dissemination, now it is open for everybody to use. You know, uh, the data is there. It can be processed in different ways with the development in, in technology. Nowadays, a lot of energy, uh, emerging technologies are coming. The same data can be processed with different angle. So, to enhance, expedite, and uh, facilitate mineral exploration coverage of India, uh, this National Geoscience Data Repository portal has been developed. And it, it is open uh, for everybody to uh, access the data. It is GIS-based platform. All the exercise which can be done in GIS can be done there. A lot of layers are there, starting from basic geoscience uh, uh, layer that is 1 is to 50,000 uh, 50, uh, um, scale ge geological map. Thereafter, different layers uh, 
uh, I, I would be showing those things in, in brief, uh, along with the uh, data base available for the offshore regions uh, in some detail. Yeah. Uh, this is the um, interface of uh, our National Geoscience Data Repository Portal, NGDA portal. You have to give sim uh, simple uh, authentication uh, to, uh, to explore that. Uh, without even registering, you can explore what, what are the data available in our portal, but for downloading, you have to uh, give some basic credentials. Thereafter, you can download the data as per your requirement. Yeah. These are different tools. First one is for uh, map visualization, interactive analysis tool, report download, and data download. You can uh, uh, you have to uh, keep in mind without registering, you cannot download the data. You can uh, see and access what type of data are available there. Uh, I would be showing different layers, what are they available there in brief. Uh, the first one is the, first one is the standard geological map, which is the most sought data from Geological Survey of India by different stakeholders, agencies. Before starting any geological exploration, this type of layer is must. You start anything from this layer. So whole the country, around 5,000 topo seeds has been covered by Geological Survey of India with a vast uh, database including all the lithol uh, basic uh, uh, inputs, uh, lithology, st uh, then stratigraphy, uh, linear features, uh, planar features, uh, everything is there. Uh, so you can simply uh, explore the area, you can download the area as per your wish. Thereafter, one another layer that is geological map on one is to two million, which is the compiled geological map from our basic uh, data. Uh, for regional studies, such type of data is required. You can uh, use this one. Apart from that, geomorphological, man, uh, geomorphological and lineament map, which is the collaboration work of Geological Survey of India and NRSC, uh, that, that is also there uh, for every type of use. Thereafter, uh, as you know, Ministry of Mines is auctioning different blocks. What is the status of those different blocks, location, and other metadata that is also available uh, in our portal? Apart from that, one another robust database and very vast database of Geological Survey of India that is the chemical database, geochemical database uh, uh, under the project National Geochemical Mapping Program. In this program, we have covered more than uh, around 13 lakh square kilometer area for the stream sediments as sampling and analysis. That data is also available. You can select the topo seeds, the area, uh, the basic uh, facilities also there. Uh, on the view, you can see what are the important areas for particular mineral. All the, you know, we have database for almost all the elements and oxides uh, for each and every uh, sample. Simply you select what, what is the element or oxide you are interested in. You will see uh, on, on the screen what is the general concent concent concentration of that particular mineral or oxide in that area. Otherwise, you simply download it and thereafter uh, analyze in your own system. Apart from that, ge geophysical database, ground geophysical database as well as aerogeophysical da database for the covered area is also available for viewing, for overlaying, for analysis, and for downloading. Then seismotectonic layers, structures are very important uh, elements to local, uh, to select the areas for mineralization. They are very uh, important factor. So, um, Structural, seismotectonic, all those things are there. I'm just going uh, rushing through that so that uh, simply you can see what are the layers available through portal. Apart from that, mineral map is also there. What are the important occurrences and reserves of different minerals in, uh, in the country? You can see, you can select using the basic tools which are available in all the GIS soft, uh, softwares. Those tools are available. Simply go through the info button. You will get all the information of that particular point. What is the grade? What is the min uh, location? Uh, what is the assay of different uh, minerals? Everything is there. Tectonic map, major parts, lineaments, Sear zones, everything is there. Uh, one of the five blocks we have till covered under the, the aerogeophysical program, that data is also available. 
Apart from that, APSO data is available. As you know, around 20, uh, 20 lakh square kilometer area is there for which we have the uh, baseline geoscience data for APSO areas. And out of 5 lakh uh, potential areas uh, in the APSO, around 2.9, uh, around 3 lakh square kilometer uh, data for, for that is also available in our portal. See, these are the different layers uh, for the marine geology, core samples, location of core samples and all the data, EZ and CZ map, grab simple map, surface sediments uh, distribution maps and their metadata, surface sedimentation distribution, every is there in the marine geology layer, and another is marine geophysics layer in which bathymetry of contours, uh, gravity data, magnetic data, magnetic data of different, uh, different uh, um, variables are also available there. Shallow and deep seismic data is also available there. So these are the different layers of the APSO areas uh, that is available there. Yeah. Apart from that, th these are the different la data layers actually. Apart from that, a lot of uh, um, infrastructure layers are also uh, integrated into a portal through Gati Sakti portal. So you can overlay those layers like what are the um, uh, electricity, rivers, road network, uh, and agro, um, agro climatic conditions. All those layers are also available uh, in our portal. You can overlay and uh, do uh, exercise. And thereafter, uh, you can download data. I'm not going to tell how to download. Simply, actually, all the help files and video is also in the, uh, is there. And it is so user friendly. Once you open, every button is, uh, uh, tells you how to do and uh, how you are getting the data. Uh, once you select the data, you can select by drawing a polygon, or you can select a state, district, and poly, uh, toposite. In, uh, in any way, you can select the area. Uh, thereafter, the data, which is in the point, point say, file or polygon, it will be, uh, one link will be sent to your registered email, and there uh, you will be downloading all the data in save file or GeoJSON format as you are interested. Uh, otherwise, all the reports can be downloaded uh, immediately uh, uh, to, uh, through your uh, system. That is in brief, and uh, uh, actually uh, we are always updating, uh, updating our uh, this portal, and uh, we are in a process to uh, uh, get APIs from other agencies who, who are having uh, this type of data in their portal. Uh, through API, those data will be available here. Uh, that that process is uh, uh, on the way, and uh, from other agencies, apart from GSI, other agencies' data reports we are digitizing and uh, uploading in this uh, portal and uh, with due time it will be very robust portal with all the data of the stakeholders for use thank you very much sir. no sir actually and see one is to 25000 map if you see that that layer some part which uh, that has not been covered because you have to uh, uh, do rigorous field work uh, going everywhere. But with the help of other data, we have compiled that part uh, in one is to two million. Uh, you might have seen in two million uh, scale that that part is covered. But one is to twenty five thousand scale that has not uh, that is inaccessible for us. Excuse me. Can I get high resolution? Uh, bathymetry data from your portal? Definitely, bathymetry data is there. You can download. Thank you, sir. I have, uh, I have two questions. Yes, sir. One is that your NGDR data has, uh, has only... Sunabhai Saha, your NGDR data has only online data or does it have offshore data also? Offshore data is also there. Okay, so I thought that didn't come out very clearly in the presentation, but you have to tell people, I know that, yeah. but you have to tell people yeah. that the entire offshore data, yeah. which you have developed uh, over the last 40, 50 years, yeah. is also available uh, in the NGDR. Yes, sir. And people can access that also. Yeah. You know, especially DGH, 
who is yet to give the data in public domain, but he can take our data in, uh, and access that. So, second thing is that there is another NGDR which is floating around. If you Google NGDR, no? There is one more NGDR which comes up, which is National Geospatial Data Repository Policy of Sir, that so is N register. NGDRS, so yes, sir. Uh, huh? NGDRS, yes, sir. Uh, what is it? National uh, Registry System. Correct. It is called National Geospatial Data Registry or Register, something like that. Yeah. Registry, mm. which is under DST. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm. So I met Secretary DST 10 days back. So he yeah. told me about this. Yeah. So they, the DST is the custodian of gathering all geospatial data and bringing it to one platform. Mm -hmm. they, are the, they are the ones who are responsible in Government of India. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they are creating that uh, resist register and uh, we are only one piece of the entire uh, geospatial data. data yes. So therefore, since you are in charge of NGDR, you should know what the other NGDR is doing, yeah. what are their timelines. Their timelines are a bit slower compared to ours. That is what I realized. Okay, so you should readily collaborate with them okay, and say that your piece of the puzzle is ready. Okay. And anytime they want, you will do the integration seamlessly and this data will go into the overall geospatial data registry. Right? Okay, sir. I, I don't know if there is anyone from DST in this group, mm -hmm. but uh, they should have raised. Nevertheless, you talk to, uh, Pradeep Singh knows we went to the second DST. Okay, you sir. coordinate with, uh, there is, I think there is a committee or something like that. Okay, there is some officer whom I met. Sir, Srikant, kya? Koi ek aadmi se milete hai. Ah, so, uh, with that uh, Srikant Acharya, you coordinate okay. and make sure you proactively say that my information is ready and here I am giving it to you. Okay. You should get a certificate that you are the first person to go to the NGDR and the number will be added to the DGH. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, moving forward, uh, I request the representative from NCPR to share uh, his uh, light over the database. I think no specific presentation is there, so he can... NCPR to already shared. Uh. <laughs> there is, he's already given a presentation. presentation in there. Yeah. So you can skip. Okay, sir. Next. Uh, uh, the representative from NIO, can, they can throw some light on their database. Okay. So uh, now the stage is open for other organization or agencies who would like to share this inf information about their database. No, I want to hear from, uh, of course, any government agency which has not spoken so far, which has data and they want to come and talk about their data, number one. Number two, about the industry. About, about the, uh, I want to hear the industry coming and saying, whether this data is enough or they want more and what kind of hand-holding they want. These two, anyone wants to speak, they can speak. Yeah. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Secretary Sir, and other dignitaries and uh, others. Myself, Dr. Hari Kumar. I am a senior scientist from Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, Sir. Um, uh, I, I have been hearing right from the morning about First lot of, of all, you answer. Yes, sir. First of all, you answer why this conference is full of Malayalis. <laughs> <laughs> huh? 
maybe first answer would be like malayali malayali sir well educated no no there may have been a, there may have been a college or a university yes 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 let me huh? yeah i'll i'll tell you realistically sir no sir i i am i am a physicist uh, but i have uh, done my phd from kusat kusat cochin university of science and technology has the course which is in line with earth system science for example oceanography um, uh, meteorology etc and also some colleges in uh, kerala are, is having geology as a subject and uh, even post graduation so that is the main reason i, I understand yeah and uh, now coming back to the point uh, i would like to just add on sir uh, we are uh, from uh, or under ministry of earth sciences uh, our sister organizations are niot Uh, you know uh, ncapar nss etc and inco is uh, we uh, do uh, the same way imd does for the weather forecasting we do the forecasting and warning services for ocean or pertaining to the ocean so uh, so far uh, we have done many projects for ongc uh, in uh, different perspectives one is for continuous forecasting uh, for their uh, rig regions and region and platform Uh, for the kg basin for the last 5 years and they were taking a forecast and it is uh, for your uh, you know information that it is uh, financial implications and uh, uh, other project we have done for uh, extreme uh, value analysis and return period analysis which is for the construction of their you know some of the platforms uh, way back in 2017 uh, these are uh, to name a few so uh, in this context i would like to inform you that Uh, any explorations which are offshore or coastal uh, we would be benefited with our data in two ways one is we are having general forecast on you know ocean waves swells currents and also we are having uh, many uh, other warning services which are called high wave alerts uh, when there is a chance for high waves to approach uh, and high waves in the uh, you know main uh, offshore region we will warn you and also we are having even we are the center uh, providing tsunami early warning which may not be much useful for you but at the same time i would like to bring to your notice then other services are like some ecosystem related services uh, like harm, harmful algae bloom where it is uh, you know possibility and also we are having this uh, coral reef alerts etc and uh, we are well known for potential fishing zone advisory services to the Uh, population actually uh, to benefit to the society so in this context uh, two types one is general forecasting can be availed from our organization uh, you may please uh, go through our website uh, incois.gov.in you can uh, anybody can avail even uh, in the offshore region our services on or forecast on waves swells currents etc that is totally free and at the same time any kind of user customization or any kind of extra information you need to integrate with that we are ready to give uh, geographical user interface for the uh, specific client even the private agencies which are going to be your prospective clients we are ready to serve for them this is a announcement for that and uh, last but not the least uh, we have uh, i think uh, Uh, pradeep sir may be knowing me because we are having close collaboration regarding this uh, uh, through dg hydrocarbon we are the people to ensure the safety of enp operators there is a project in pipeline and uh, that is being worked out by uh, uh, dd roy and all those uh, team sir yes. yeah 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 so it's a big project for the development of gui in collaboration with imd and that is also being uh, under construction and that will be also Uh, useful equally for the explorers from your side sir thank you good afternoon sir i am ajit oswal from alta tech cement uh, first of first and foremost my compliments to secretary mines and gsi for holding this kind of workshop and enlightening us on availability of huge resources mineral resources and one of the important uh, mineral resources which we come across is the lime mud i mean we were ne never aware that such kind of uh, resources available in the offshore and that is of interest uh, to us as far as cement industry is concerned uh, 
we are the currently, I mean, having 140 million ton capacity in India. I mean, that is the largest capacity anywhere in the world, a single company holding. So, uh, and we do import uh, high-grade limestone uh, so as to blend with our low-grade limestone resources which are available. Uh, as I mean, it discussed in the morning that act and rules are in the formation. We have also given our inputs, uh, 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 suggestions, etc. Uh, the one thing which which was there, I mean, uh, uh, that EIA it was mentioned in the draft somewhere that EIA would be done after G2 level of prospecting. But as we have seen in today's presentation that various uh, project, I mean, which initiated offshore projects, due to some environmental uh, activism or some issues, I mean, they need to discontinue. So, I mean, these EIA studies should be done beforehand, actually, for these projects, so that I, once, I mean, uh, companies go ahead with the project, uh, they, it should be able to execute it. Uh, exploration agency, of course, it was discussed that uh, there would be empanel exploration agency would be doing the exploration on G2, G3 level. Uh, mining technology is a big challenge. I mean, as on, uh, we could not see, I mean, in uh, today's deliberation, even worldwide, we could not see any, any, anywhere this kind of uh, mining being practiced. So, how the technology would be uh, feasible, etc. That that I mean, exploration we also need to uh, carry out. Uh, another important point from industry perspective is the feasibility and cost economics, because today we import uh, limestone, say from Oman, from UAE, etc. Uh, cost maybe around two to three dollar is the mine. I mean, material cost and another six to seven dollar is the transportation cost. So maybe around nine to ten dollar is the total uh, cost <coughs> at the coastal plants. And of course, if we need to take to inland, it will additional cost would be there. What we, we have seen, like Jaisalmer is, is a, uh, having high grade limestone resources. Even Jaisalmer to like, for example, Gujarat, if you want to bring limestone, high-grade limestone, it is a costly affair, rather than importing is a cheaper option. So from that perspective, that how it would be a cost economics in terms of the import, that also need to be seen. Another important factor uh, which we have found in our coastal deposit, we also operate in Gujarat, three plants, so where the chlorine content is very high. Chlorine content, we need to install bypass system which consume additional energy and additional resources, etc. So whether those data would be available for lime mud, uh, I mean if, if those are available, that would be useful or useful for us to establish those things. Even the moisture, because this this material would be a moist material, maybe uh, maybe 25, 30 percent moisture. So how that need to be treated, so that also need to be taken care. We have seen various presentation in, we have seen that different government agencies are having their the own data repository, own objective, like ONGC is having a lot of uh, <coughs> data repository and their own interest area in terms of oil and gas. So how they, they are overlapping, suppose some block are allocated uh, from Ministry of Mines and oil, ONGC is also exploring that area from oil and gas perspective. So whether both can coexist or how that exclusivity uh, would be made out. So while formatting, uh, formulating rules or policies, that could be taken into account. So that would be useful. But overall, I would say it was very, very interesting and useful session. And we, we hope to see more uh, such interactions going forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now it's time for concluding session. As we set on this intellectual journey, we hope that this workshop had offered and the attendees a plethora of insights enable fruitful interactions and inspiring fresh perspective about the offshore exploration. Now I request Sir Shri V. L. Kantarao, Secretary, Ministry of Mines, for his closing remarks of this workshop.
वेलकम सर Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I listed out a few objectives in the morning for this workshop, and one of the objectives is that uh, I want to learn. So I don't know about other objectives, but uh, the objective of my learning has been fulfilled according to me. I've got to know a lot about uh, this offshore uh, sector, which otherwise I did not know. and i am very thankful to all the presentations made by uh, uh, various agencies of government of india in the morning uh, where they explained as to what kind of work they do and uh, we tried to find synergy we tried to find uh, uh, collaborative methods we tried to discuss uh, coordination between those agencies and the ministry of mines so that uh, offshore exploration offshore data management and offshore mining can be taken forward so i am sure other uh, participants in the workshop also have gained some insights into what uh, related agencies do uh, we also got to know a little bit about i'm impressed with the private sector participation and the presentation here uh, we also got to know how private sector is gearing up to take on the challenge of uh, uh, of doing uh, exploration of doing certain projects of doing the of of getting ourselves of getting the country ready for uh, doing uh, offshore mining on the session that we just had on data i think that was a very fruitful session where uh, so many agencies talked about the data that they have the data that they have on uh, uh, offshore uh, uh, material available also on the onshore uh, Uh, drilling that they do and the data that is available we uh, we have quite liberalized our approach to the data availability to public so gsi is probably the one agency which has uh, 170 years of data put in the public domain i'm yet to see another agency which has uh, which has done that till now but uh, i am sure with the geospatial policy that uh, the cabinet has approved a few years back all things will fall in place other agencies will uh, also put up their data even uh, even atomic uh, minerals division has also yesterday in my meeting agreed to put that data which is of not their use and but which they have uh, spent money in collecting the data they have agreed to part with that data share with that uh, data with us sharing data with us means that it will become part of our ngdr and therefore it will become part of the public domain so knowing that they have agreed to do that i think once the data is in place we need now data analysts and experts who can read and understand and uh, come up with uh, inferences based on data and we need exploration agencies who pick up those inferences and uh, do exploration and we are willing to fund exploration 100% after exploration we will do auction of mining for which our rules will be in place i uh, i i i want to repeat what mustaq said in the morning that please go through these draft rules which we are placing in our uh, website for public consultation we have placed two three we are going to place two three more in the next uh, 10 15 days go through them and give us uh, comments so that 
we improve upon these rules. As someone said, uh, there are not many experiences across the world on uh, offshore mining, the kind of mining that we are talking about. So therefore, it is important that we all together put our uh, minds and then uh, come up with a very good system. There are one or two other countries which are doing, which have a few SOPs and uh, protocols. We are trying to copy them, but uh, the, the moment we complete our work in, in the next two, three months, we will be one of the pioneering countries in taking uh, the offshore mining forward. So I think to that extent, this workshop will be uh, a big, big contribution to that uh, goal that India wants to uh, achieve. So in the, in the end, uh, Madam, there is no vote of thanks now to this. Achha, then I will leave it for uh, the whoever is giving the vote of thanks. So I, uh, I want to uh, say that uh, today let us go back with this message that we need to collaborate at every stage, at every level and continuously at uh, a cutting edge, le cutting edge level like this. The people who were present here today are actually the experts and the, who are at the cutting edge level. We need to collaborate at this level and also I have to ensure that the collaboration happens at, uh, uh, at Delhi for which I'm doing uh, my work of uh, meeting the secretaries and organizing interministerial group meetings and so on and so forth. So let us all together work towards the, the first mine to be, to be taken up by JNPT, the first few mines to be auctioned and uh, in, in coming uh, few years, the actual uh, mining uh, to happen in this country in the offshore areas. Thank you very much. Sir, I think NCCR uh, representative is expecting uh, to, rep to hand over the reports of NCCR, sir. I request yes. Ramnathan Sahab, please. Now, uh, coming towards the end of the session, uh, there is one more actually, uh, I, I just want to uh, tell to our the participants, before we adjourn, I would like to announce that a field trip to St. Mary's Island is arranged tomorrow morning. Interested participant, please be ready. The vehicle, uh, at eight o'clock, the vehicle is made available for pick and drop. With this, uh, मैं दो दो शब्द हिंदी में कुछ बोलना चाहूँगी अगर सर की सर अगर इजाजत दे तो सुना है आज समंदर को बड़ा गुमान आया है सुना है आज समंदर को बड़ा गुमान आया है उधर ही ले चलो कश्ती जहाँ तूफान आया है थैंक यू सर with this, I request Dr. N.M. Sharif, Director of PSS, MCST GSI Mangalore, to propose a vote of thanks to this incredible gathering of individuals who had contributed the success of this event. Please, Sharif Sahib. After the day-long deliberations, it is time for expressing gratitude to all those who made this day very memorable. Secretary, Ministry of Mines have been bringing in a lot of changes in the ministry since he's taken over charge. More noteworthy is his keenness in changing the psyche and approach of all of us in matters of exploration and exploitation. Sir, 
your presence and guidance is really an inspiration and encouragement and I thank you for your presence and guidance, sir. <laughs> sir, I believe uh, we have lived up to your expectation today. And I show, sir, our future endeavors in fulfilling your expectations and bringing sea changes in our activities and outputs. Thank you, sir, for guiding us, inspiring us, and asking us to deliver. Director General, Geological Survey of India, has been a constant support in executing the roadmaps which have been laid down by the Ministry of Mines. Thank you, sir, for your constant support and making every endeavor possible. <laughs> we have with us a lot of senior officers from Geological Survey of India, Additional Director General, Southern Region, Deputy Director General, National Mission 1, Deputy Director General, National Mission 2, CMD from MECL, ADG, uh, DGH, dignitaries from Ministry of uh, MOES, from Ministry of Mines, and all other institutions. Sir, without your presence, this day would not have been so memorable. It is your participation which made the difference, which is, your in, which is the intellectual interactions which you made, and some of the deliberations, especially from uh, dele delegates from uh, NC NIOT, MOES, NCPR, NIO, AD, uh, uh, KMM, uh, uh, this uh, NGI, NGRI, of course, uh, they promised us to deliver, but unfortunately they could not come, sir. And IRL also made a presentation, GMRI and solutions, all of you.